Terrific. Terrific. Um, Gabe Smith, so great to see you again. Thanks for the invitation. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm Gabriel Smith um, at Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners in New York City. I'm a director there. Um, you know, we have a practice of about 25 people. We do a lot of uh, cultural projects, including one right near you guys that we just finished, the Glenstone Museum um, uh, in Potomac. Fantastic. Nice to be here. Terrific. Uh, Ife? Uh, Lindsay, did you say that Ife was here or not here yet? I don't think when I was looking, she had signed in yet. Um, and since she isn't okay. speaking up. All right. Um, Adam. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Adam Urensky. I'm a partner and one of the founders of Architecture Research Office, which is an architecture firm in New York City. We're about the same size as uh, Thomas Pfeiffer, around 25 to 30 people. And um, do a diverse range of program uh, work and different sites. And I'm looking forward to seeing the projects this afternoon. Terrific. Um, thank you all so much for being here. And I think what we're gonna do is, uh, is start off with uh, uh, Jefferson Choi um, and uh, have his, his uh, presentation. He will be leading off uh, this afternoon. Welcome everybody. So I'm going to screen share yep. on behalf of Jefferson and Jefferson, and then whenever it's over, you can do the mural and take it from there. Exactly. Hello, I'm Jefferson Choi, and thank you so much. Takes a minute to get. Yep. Well, I'm Jefferson Choi, and thank you so much for attending my thesis presentation. First, I would like to thank my thesis chair, Professor Tillman, and my thesis committee, Professor Bell and Professor Simon, for the guidance of the thesis process. And also, special thanks to my friends and family. Um, I wouldn't be here without their support. So, without further ado, I present to you Going Beyond the Game Evolving the City Through an Esports Venue. So first, I will be introducing the thesis driver being esports and the opportunity it brings at Tyson's Virginia, highlighting the five design tenants and going over the design proposal of this new esports venue titled the Tyson's Reboot. Um, with the pandemic, we created a stronger extent, uh, bond with technology. So this made me think, how can we fuse architecture and technology um, to create engaging, connected environments? Um, how can esports, um, being such an intelligent tech uh, culture that creates very strong connectivity with people digitally in the physical world, um, create a sense of place in a new urban space or existing urban space? And Ultimately, how can human-centered design strategies blend the physical digital world to create such holistic experiences in the future planning of cities? So esports being known as electronic competitive game, gaming, um, pretty much becomes a fusion of a cinematic experience and a music concert experience, like traditional game, um, sport matches where thousands of fans go in person to experience the culture and support their favorite teams. Um, esports is the same where they cheer on for their teams that are battling their opponents um, through a computer generated game. Um, so it becomes a very uh, ex digital experiential experience with LED lights, sound, and, um, and with the hands on hands-on uh, connection with the digital world. Um, Esports could be live streamed anywhere from home. Um, even the matches are live broadcasted. Um, Esports is on the rise as an international phenomenon, um, being one of the fastest growing entertainment industries with over 300 million viewers and over a billion of revenue. There's consists of 
only 30 esport venues that host these games in the United States, mostly being um, performance halls and convention centers, and only five that are dedicated to esports. Um, esports venues are kind of craved now for um, highlighting the digital experience and the ease of not having to bring all the equipment to a new venue. So introducing an esports venue in Tyson's Virginia could anchor this culture on the East Coast. East being some esport venues in the United States, um, this one being the largest one now in Arlington, Texas, and soon to be in Philly, the Fusion Arena, having consisting over 3,000 seating. So the selected city was Tyson's, Virginia, as is known as the satellite city of Washington, D.C., um, being locally and regionally accessible through the Silver Line and also becoming international destination with the close proximity to the Dallas airport. So Tyson's itself is a retail center uh, with this growing skyline of high rise buildings. However, this image um, is kind of not the prettiest as the city is known notoriously for its traffic. So Tyson's throughout a year started as an agriculture city and then bloomed into a retail and employment center due to the Capitol Beltway and the Dallas Airport and the new Tyson's Corner Center. Um, so there's an immense um, evolving of office buildings, uh, one being the Capitol Building, Capitol One Building, and soon to construct the new tallest tower in the DC metropolitan area. Um, so Tyson's is going through a city identity crisis as people call Tyson's a dead center, the unfinished city of outgrowth of DC. And due to the large scale, their city has difficulties in bringing in people. So incorporating a new entertainment typology at Tyson's could be a great opportunity to change Tyson's as an urban center and a futuristic tech city as a place brand, branding strategy. So right now, Tyson's consists of 100,000 jobs and only 17,000 residents. And in the comprehensive plan in 30 years, they're gonna double the amount of jobs and grow the residents immensely. So there is a shift in ratio of providing more residents. Um, so bringing a new entertainment facility for people to work, play, and live would be a great addition to the city. Um, the city is divided to eight districts. I'll this just looks at the Tyson Central one to three district as is the heart retail of the city. The site is very urbanized with more large size buildings um, organized by the hierarchy of the street, the Dallas Airport and the Capitol Beltway and anywhere in the city you're within a one mile walking distance to the closest metro station. Um, the selected site is in the in between the two malls, parallel to the Tyson's metro station. Uh, it's in two parcels, zone left, more zone for a transit station mixed use, and the right for a residential mixed use in a park open space. Um, predominantly activity, pedestrian activity, last um, occurs at the metro. Um, entry that leads you to the third level of the ticketing booth and then connecting to the pedestrian bridge um, onto the Tyson's um, center. Looking at the existing site conditions, it's a relatively flat asphalt field um, used for um, events, um, the Cirque du Soleil, and you can see that overwhelming intersection of the metro leading you to the site from entering the city and departing the city. Um, there are feasibility studies on this site uh, with that zoning with the transit resident uh, transit hub here and residential buildings on the right. Um, looking at the experience, um, this intersection heavily being traffic activity, car activity. Um, this very unpretty parking garage into the Tyson's Galleria 
and then the bus station that drops you off to the metro station. Uh, on a Saturday during the pandemic, the Tyson's Metro really being a dead zone. However, walking towards the sky bridge, there's a more, you can start seeing people that leads to this exterior Tyson's plaza. So the five design tenants includes um, defining a gateway into the city by using an uh, ellipse pedestrian bridge, enhancing the pedestrian connectivity between the two malls, um, providing a digital experience, and crafting a new identity of Tyson's with a 24-hour urban center of work playing with. And since this is a high wattage um, building, promoting a high performance efficient strategies building. Um, an esports venue is dissected into three parts, front of the house being more of the public spaces like gaming centers, exhibition space, lounge space, the back of the house holding the service spaces, the technological infrastructure spaces, and then the main area being the esports arena, expo space, broadcasting rooms, VIP booths. So looking at the user profiles of this site um, being used for eSport fans, could be amateurs, new fans, just a place for um, people interested in eSports or willing to learn more about eSports could engage with other people. And even localist residents or visitors looking for a place where they could finally shop and engage with the city and be part of a pedestrian scale. And then for commuters who just come to Tyson's off the metro, off the car, who just quickly go to work and quickly leave to avoid the traffic, has an opportunity of places um, to engage with. So presenting you the Tyson's reboot, uh, opportunities of anchoring the void between the two malls, humanizing the scale of the buildings for pedestrian activity, linking the retail hearts um, by densifying the city, um, establishing a connected city through with the other developments, having connections with the Capital One headquarters uh, for the metro station to the next. Um, looking at um, the new development sectionally programmatically with the transit um, retail space of mixed use residential and commercial buildings, corporate buildings that on a, pet, a podium building, um, dedicated with the East Sports venue, um, linked by the pedestrian bridge, called, known as the player ring, to the hotel for that connectingness with the venue, and then uh, engaging with the residential zone and then onto the screen park. So overall, the master planning follows a strong edge of the city itself until Tyson's Boulevard introduces a more organic ring as a landmark for visitors entering from the Beltway into the city or people entering going to different districts, the retail districts and the corporate districts of the city. And it's seeing that strong connectiveness from the two malls to one or the other, as opposed to being abruptly stopped here. Um, looking at the part T is going beyond the game itself. So seeing that connectedness from the pedestrian bridge, um, having the crown esports um, arena, followed by this vertical digital ramp circulation for people to ascend down and up their digital journey. And then after events, people having the opportunity to bleed out onto the elevated courtyard. So looking at it, the, the proposal sectionally, um, seeing the relationship with the metro as on the street level, people enter and then go up escalators onto the third level, which is the ticketing level, um, which will be engaged with the exterior court level where people have the option now to walk through the venue um, itself and then go outside and then go continue to Tyson's Galleria or go the opposite way to a different mall. Um, just introducing the user profiles again, the players, residents, and the commuters. Um, 
from street level access, once again, having a bus drop off, leading you to the metro station onto the third platform. And there are people can engage and go into the venue itself or from the retail street level, people could go engage into the building and then circulate up to the second level uh, where here they're introduced to the digital hall level. Um, since it is tucked under the elevator platform facing um, the platform level of the metro, it becomes more of a dark um, space for more of a digital realm that people would gather having more retail space, or maybe a VR arcade, and then people can engage with the exposition space and more smaller flex rooms. And introducing this new um, digital glass ramp that one could go up to the next floor onto that third level where that courtyard level is, and then people have options to leave out, engage in the courtyard, or continue towards the east side of the building and go on top of this once again transparent pedestrian bridge into the court um, hotel side. Um, going up again in the building is a continuation of the esports arena with this long um, ramp following a traditional configuration of the esports or, or of, a, of a theater that looks into the state um, stage. In terms of materiality, using more of a steel veneer with LED panels and horizontal fins to mitigate um, solar gain and having under light lighting, um, using LED screens for opportunity of signage and greeting into the city and the wedge of the crown of the eSport becoming a jewel lit up LED screen box. So here again, seeing the relationship of the ring to the elevated courtyard. Here on the south side of one, the metro station, seeing that digital hall top with the courtyard um, and that connection through to the metro and going through the building itself to the pedestrian bridge. And seeing the engagement with the elevated courtyard with the building itself of this large digital screen and the, underneath the digital Paul, um, looking at these vignettes, looking at the vehicular access from the West Park Drive from the corporate district into this, um, towards the main intersection of the city. You could see the activity of people, just more activated of people on the street level, which is missing today. Here from the Metro's ground entry level, seeing the life of the pedestrian bridge and following that glass, transparent glass, opaque glass that becomes a light beacon. And from the metro access entering, um, new people into the city gets welcomed by this new glowed up building um, as a wayfinder into the city. Um, on the ground level entry leads you to the triple height atrium space that could be used for activities like fan meetings, um, just becomes a main gallery exhibition space and going up to the third level with the player ring, um, seeing becoming more just programmatic where people could float out and play games, VRs, and just gather with the community. Uh, here showing you the experience from exiting from the venue to the um, residential side and the hotel side. This being a public gaming room open to the public. So not only during um, is when there's an event, it's also activated when there's no game for people to gather around. Um, this shows the experience of players that could lounge around in a private room. Um, again, the digital hall becoming a more darkened away from the city experience into this digital realm with interactive digital walls. And then you see, get to experience this long extension of a ramp called the surge ramp, replicating the style of the pedestrian bridge. Um, people ascending, overlooking the courtyard as they descend from expo level 
to the crown being the esports venue. And here, meeting the destination of where they could cheer on for the um, favorite um, games. And then on the level of courtyard, not only um, a space not just only dedicated to esport players, but also a space for commoners, residents, localists to be part of this culture. They could engage this public site and sit on the terrace seating and look at the digital screen playing an esports game. And looking at high performance strategies, um, as this building becomes a smart building itself, looking having a building integrated photovoltaics on the roof, um, using energy efficient cooling systems and water and air quality monitors, using energy harvesting through kinetic tile technology and using um, selective solar glazing materials in a green roof. So once again, seeing the opportunity of the site becoming this new urban center that's also high performing, um, engages a dis, uh, digital experience, have a strong pedestrian connectedness and becoming a landmark of the city of Tyson's. Um, so like, sit, like a computer that's been overworked and needs to get restarted, Tyson's is also overworked and is in the need to reboot itself, bring in the Tyson's reboot, will bring the opportunity of the city to grow into a futuristic city. Thank you. And I look forward to our conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, Jefferson, and if you can share the, the link to the uh, mural app, there it is in the chat. And then we can share, there you go. Okay, and with that, we will um, open it up to uh, juror comments. Everybody's getting on the mural. Can you blow that up just a little bit, uh, Jefferson? Not a lot, yeah. Great. I have a couple of questions just to clarify. If you could go to the cross section, the site section, and just talk a little bit more about the programs in some of the adjacent buildings that are uh, within the development you're proposing. Uh, sure. Um, Great, thank you. So pretty much using the left parcel, the larger parcel um, of a mixed use transit hub area. So there'll be mixed use residential buildings and a mixture of um, commercial buildings um, activated in a more podium style typology and then leading you the strong access towards the elevated courtyard and then into the venue itself. And then the right parcel hosting the hotel, having that relationship as opportunity to connect both um, parcels together, leading to more of a residential zone, um, transcending down to a green park area. Jefferson, thank you so much for this comprehensive presentation. It was, um, you know, it was really quite uh, clear in terms of, of both your ambition um, <laughs> for the project and also um, your, the way in which you've really assembled a lot of complex uh, ideas, uh, particularly as it relates to the context. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rare thing to really um, see uh, how, how well a student understands the context in general. And, and I, I think that is the strength of the project in, you know, in as much as I can understand it in its totality. Um, I guess I, I, I want to kind of ask a couple of questions because I think yeah, your, sure. your thesis um, really begs some discussion of w w what the character of digital uh, um, 
or art architecture, <laughs> you know, what, what is what is it that differentiates this architecture from um, other architecture, for instance? Maybe, maybe you weren't trying to do that, but it seems like you've raised that question by by taking on a a program and a type um, that is really all about that. And I and I guess even more specifically. Um, because you've said the building is a bridge and a connector and it is metaphorically at least um, that, I, th I think that there are some things you're doing with the language of the building um, that are externally um, very exuberant. And I think what I'm interested in is at the, at the scale of two players or three players or a hundred people inside the building, what is it that you think the connective tissue is there or is it is that something in the digital world that doesn't matter? Yeah, that's a great question. I think ultimately from my thesis, that was a question and a concept that I was really trying to um, incorporate in my thesis. I guess from the question, I wanted a building to be very conceptual, contextual, fit with the city itself. Um, this is a very different program. So the question from the beginning, do I become old? Um, do I do something organic, something crazy? I was looking at precedents like the Dongdaemun Design Plaza designed by Zahar Hadid um, in South Korea. And that was a great precedent example of this very spaceship organic building sitting in the city, um, being a very connection, connective tissue throughout the entire building itself. And they use the like materialities of aluminum cladding with immense LED lights just to glow up. Um, I guess from this building proposal for itself, um, I guess I was visualizing this big gaming event that uh, occurs at like nighttime in a dark setting. So during the day, it also fits with the site, but it also stands out, um, doesn't overwhelm the site. And then throughout the day, it becomes a very glowing um, digital building that screams out, hey, we're a tech building, um, becoming a city that becomes a futuristic city. Um, I, I think what I'd, if I could just beg your pardon and ask you to go to your interior elevations for just, or your interior perspectives, just pick one. I mean, any, any one of them. Um, it, like these two, just go back for a second where the guy's playing on, on the Oculus there. It seems like it seems like your thesis is proofed out here a little bit, and to me, it it's the way in which this blue light begins to kind of be fuzzy and and change the relationship between the structure and the skin of the building, mm -hmm. and um, you know, to to me, this is this is a huge kind of opportunity to investigate or to um, with maybe with one or two more details and maybe an interior elevation or two to really dissect what you're doing here with these renderings, which is, I think it's a little more than just kind of coloring. I think there could be potentially in the column base, for instance, an attitude about a, a kind of, of lightness, so to speak, um, in, and, and a, and a kind of an attitude about how architecture works, because I, I would say that the strongest parts for me are the parts that are beginning to allude to um, what the digital age might look like in real building form. I mean, it's a hard thing to do because we're so we're, we're all of all of the digital tools at our disposal right now are kind of trying to get us into fantasy world and get us away from our current reality. But I think it would be, I think if you, if you, it, it would be a shame to me if you didn't at least address that directly when you write about your thesis in the next couple of weeks. Thank yeah, you. I think that's a great point. I think I love, got a little bit, <laughs> a little bit over with the colors, but I guess programmatically, that digital oasis, I was thinking about having that occur at the digital retail area, um, similar to like a transit hub, like the Union DC, um, the Union Station, becoming uh, under, under the courtyard, becoming our dark zone um, with LED walls, um, 
having an interactive wall um, potentially for future um, art exhibits, um, area where people could interact with. Um, hi, my name is Annie. I, I didn't get to introduce myself. I'm representing um, Shop Architects and oh, I'm happy to be here. Um, if I could kind of expand on um, the line of questioning that Gabrielle started. Um, Jefferson, thank you for such an ambitious project. Um, very comprehensive. And I think that you're touching on some some very profound points. Um, you know, I heard a, a segment yesterday, a radio segment on, um, you know, wh where is the new territory going for big tech? And um, it's it, it seems hands down that, um, you know, Google, Apple, they, they're investing in AR, VR in these next five to 10 years. Um, it's, in, and in terms of a technology, you know, that has huge implications, but also in terms of society. And I really appreciate the fact that you're taking this opportunity to create a civic moment in, in, um, in, in the site itself with the player's ring. Um, you know, but probably a lot of practitioners here have also battled with this. You know, this is a, a virtual space um, and it's going to become more and more ubiquitous. Um, given that it's, you know, by definition, it becomes completely placeless. You know, we are, Un, we are not um, tied to any more, um, let's say, theaters or convention centers as we know it. Um, and if it, this is truly kind of taking on um, like a futuristic aspiration, um, I'm going to challenge you a little bit to kind of take a, a, a next step further in thinking sure. about this, because for me, it still feels a bit like adaptive reuse in a way, like what if we could completely um, kind of let go of, of this typology and take on the challenge of like, what is the significance of civic space? What is the significance of communal space if we no longer need it? Because in fact, this virtual world is, um, the vehicle for that is gonna be these devices, right? Um, and I, I feel like in, like in science fiction that the, these kind of technologies, um, they're not explicitly kind of put in the foreground, rather, um, you know, the kind of the best science fiction shows already the effects of these technologies that are embedded into our lives, right? So this, this is to say, maybe it's that we no longer have to think about these as kind of like high tech boxes or volumes, right? or the player circle that is this kind of defined binary of like, this is, this is the virtual and technological life. And then there's a life outside. You know, what if these become much more blurred? Um, you know, what if it's, this was like a, a, a civic building and at the end you say, by the way, this is what it's used for um, these, this e-game arena. But, you know, people have, um, come together, typologies have been pushed by thinking of new ways in which like we as a society have been coming together. So maybe the player's ring, it's a landscape element. It's, it's more completely blurred between what we see as civic space and these high performing functioning spaces. Um, but there is an element to this kind of spectacle of, of the theater, right? And if we could kind of, I mean, a lot of esports is um, being done in kind of um, adaptive reuse pro, um, uh, spaces, but if we can completely start over, like what are the technical requirements? What are the proportional requirements that, you know, that would necessitate that could really start to kind of amp it up in terms of spectacle, but then all the supporting things around it, you know, it, it could become much more blurred. So it's not, it's talking about light quality daylight, artificial light, um, and, you know, not so much LED wall, let's say. And, and I think that this is kind of where we're moving towards because this is going to be a technology that becomes more and more pervasive and ubiquitous into our lives. Um, and it, it's fascinating to think about because in the end, what's at stake is community space, how we define community and 
what is that? What is the spatial implications? What are the urbanistic implications on that? Um, and, and these are really critical questions that um, you know we're all we will be kind of dealing with more and more as we as we um, uh, come to these technologies. So I, I applaud you for taking taking this line of questioning on in, in your project. Yeah, thank you so much for their comments. I think those are really pivotal comments that you made that I was thinking about throughout this entire um, thesis process. Um, it is a truly a challenge, as you mentioned, of how to blur um, a building itself in such a technological futuristic um, program. Like the interior renderings, for example, I mean, those guys could be anywhere, right? They could be in a forest and do what they're doing. Um, so this is what I'm saying, like it's it's less of thinking about as like a, a binary, rather like this is just kind of part of our, our lives in a way. So how do we then talk about boundaries, um, spaces? Um, I, in, in my mind, it's something a little bit more, much more fluid in a way okay. and and camouflaged and um, and and layered. Really. Yeah. I mean, you phrased the stakes in your project. Uh, that those are really great comments, Annie. Really interesting. I, I mean, especially since you've chosen to locate this project in Tyson's Corner, which you know, to an outsider who hasn't spent time in Tyson's Corner, it's a sort of place, the ultimate placeless place. Um, mm -hmm. And then you introduced your project, but I want to talk about a sense of place. So, what does that mean, right? In terms of that, Annie's comments and, and Gabriel's comments were. Um, with this particular program. And I, my criticism of the project, because you have a really thoroughly, deeply well-presented project, but my criticism is that you're kind of relying upon kind of conventional tropes of civic architecture and, and buildings in terms of monumental spaces, um, which may or may not be perfectly fine, you know, on, on in, in, in the terms that we framed them in the past, but I don't know to pick up on what Annie was saying, you know, what they mean for the future. Uh, I think you could raise that, that you raise the argument and I think you could maybe answer it more um, uh, you know, radically potentially. I think one way that I've tried to enter into your project is to think about approaching it maybe less as the creation of buildings and more as the creation of in, or the design of infrastructure. Um, technology changes, uh, is always changing. Um, uh, there's a transportation piece of infrastructure there. Uh, I don't know what it means to rethink urbanism on, on every level in terms of infrastructural possibilities, but there are, you know, architects and planners in the past have thought about that, whether it's like a break in supports, it talks about like frameworks, you know, that then can get re refitted and inhabited in different ways. That's from, you know, maybe 70, 60, 70 years ago. Um, but, um, but I feel as if, you know, the, the nature of the changes of technology, the possibility that you could be anywhere doing this activity or be viewing it from anywhere um, makes you then have to um, create a more compelling case for, you know, why here and what specifically about it is, is important. Um, I think it's a really interesting problem. problem. I don't know a lot about esports, so I'm somewhat ignorant of it, but, you know, I've, I've certainly, the imagery that you have and I've read about it, and it's a fascinating phenomenon. It's also fascinating to me, and maybe because of the fact that it's taking place in these um, retrofit existing buildings, that it doesn't have its own kind of formal typology yet that's evolved. So it's sort of more conventional kind of passively viewing people playing something as opposed to maybe a deeper interaction between the spectator and the players. But um, yeah, no, it's a really, really interesting project. Thank you. I, I I think this is a, a very ambitious <clears throat> project, and I commend you for taking that on. And in, in, in being provoked by Annie's uh, uh, comments and, and, uh, and others, I wonder if the uh, um, ground plane could be more effective. You raised, so this, for me, this project is a second level project. Everything is off the ground. You're, you're getting people off the ground, off the street. and I think if you if you go to your first floor uh, plan, the, the street floor plan, I think there might have been an opportunity to close out. I don't know how to deal with this mural, so please forgive me. But I think there might have been an opportunity to kind of close off the street 
let's say this, this is not a place where cars come. And then you had an opportunity to really develop this uh, as an urban place or an urban space, because that starts to desegregate your project, right? Mm -hmm. So now you get the, the homeless, the unhoused could be there as well as the participants of this of this esports, right? You get every you get all the public there, right? You make it more you make it more fair, as I mm -hmm. I suggest that you make the city more fair. You don't separate or segregate folks because uh, of, of various attributes. And I think that could happen again if by activating and working more on this on this um ground plane there um and i see some opportunities that that could happen there i don't know how to take my my stuff away i'm sorry how do how do i anyway yeah i think that's a great point I uh, think... and and that would make it much more of an urban space public mm -hmm. space instead of a, a above the ground digital space um, and, and, and I think integrate this project more into the nature of the city, at least for people. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think right now Tyson's has that architecture typology of putting everything in the sky. Um, so I did keep that character, but I really agree with you that there's a great opportunity to activate the street, bring a different urban, um, tactic to Tyson's. Um, right now, I did just propose retail space on a street level, but I think you made a great point of how do you activate people from the street level, entry to the city, and having the opportunity to go up and circulate and experience that nature of Tyson's. Great. Hey, Jefferson. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm also not super familiar with esports, but I could definitely see my brother being one of the eSport members in this, um, that's sort of his, his niche there. Um, you raised a lot of interesting questions about the relationship between architecture and technology. And what does it mean for architecture to sort of catch up? Can it ever catch up with technology? And then and what does, does it physically need to manifest to communicate its idea, right? Um, um, and so what is the right sort of legibility and container in which this type of event or this type of typology should be? Um, because what I see now in this proposal, I could easily see it in Las Vegas or I could see it in San Jose where I grew up. Um, it's relying on a lot of, not gimmicks, but it's relying on a lot of LED lights mm -hmm. and sort of, um, artificial current technology that's trying to communicate itself as futuristic. But I guess the larger question is what, like does architecture need to embody what futurism is? So what are some of the languages in which it can manifest as? Um, because I wonder if you explored different types of massing strategies that allowed the architecture to be more subtle um, and it could actually just be a, a simpler form that would allow and rely on natural daylight and things like that without trying to sort of embody this sort of Times Square-esque, you know, billboard. Um, I think that's like one way to sort of look at it, but you pose another interesting sort of um, challenge for yourself, which is the, the nature of these assembly spaces are closed black boxes, right? And I'm interested in how you actually get the public in there. Not everyone could possibly afford to maybe participate in this. So what is that threshold? Like, if you look at your plans, I think the walls between elements, between what is paid, what is free, what is actually open to everyone, I think those are kind of the ways in which you can look at how architecture can kind of reimagine what an esports space can be, right? It's not simply taking an existing assembly typology, plopping it here, and then putting a symmetrical, you know, oval, which I think an elevated pedestrian level is great. Um, but I'm I'm really interested in sort of pushing what the new sort of image of this can be 
in the future rather than now. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I guess earlier iterations, I did have an idea of having the whole arena take this back wall and possibly using like a transparent glass material, I guess like a Houdini effect where there's a switch to, it's a glowing box and there's an opportunity to turn off the switch and then people from the outside could interact with the event happening in this space. Um, I think that could have been one tactic. Um, another thesis opportunity, I was trying to look into transformative architecture instead of just having finishes slapped on um, the walls and such. I think one opportunity was looking at how the building could transform for the future, whether like in the glass or in the black box, maybe the roof could change. Maybe there's a system where it could change um, for future programs. Um, I think that's one possibility to explore. Yeah. Um, Matt? Well, I've witnessed this evolve, um, Jefferson, and your kudos to you for bringing it to this point. Um, Tyson's is a remarkably difficult place to do anything. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, most of it sucks. And, um, <laughs> you know, years ago, they tried to do a plan to make it more pedestrian friendly. And there's only little fits and starts of places you can really do that. And it's so dominated by the automobile. Of course, you know, um, one, one wonders whether our future, you know, what we're facing in terms of climate change is going to allow it to be remain, remain that way. But it does, it, it, two thoughts. Um, one is if, if this wasn't at a metro station, which I think is pushing everything up in the air, mm -hmm. what would it be, you know? Um, and how would you deal with the public realm? Because you, you get a kind of pass on this because it's at the metro station level. And obviously people are going to come off the train there and that's going to be the big attraction. The other thing that I think you would want to think about with a project like this and, and having done a few of these sorts of things um, in terms of master planning is, you know, what, what sort of venues and somebody was talking earlier, I think Adam was talking earlier about the different kinds of public events and public buildings that, that we look at today after COVID and other things. You, you would have some, you would have a, a, a um, developer, uh, an events developer that would come in and analyze the district and say, well, we need to do X amount of event nights a year in order to sustain this, right? Mm -hmm. And so what would that, they would probably force you into a kind of architecture that could be adaptable for lots of other things, just to make it something that somebody could could um, afford to build, you know, because I don't know that you're going to have 300 nights a year of esports. Maybe, maybe it's that popular. I don't know. I'm not aware that it is. You know more about it than I do. <laughs> but if it's not that popular, then you got to fill it in with other things. And you'd have to figure out how to make what you've designed adaptable to other tenants that might be in a place like this. And um, it may force you to make the architecture more neutral or more adaptable. And then buried in the thesis might be this idea both of esports and adaptability to other things to support esports so that you can have esports, but then you can have other stuff as well. Um, and, and, you know, because it, it, it is the sort of thing that is a bit of a rarefied kind of event thing these days. And maybe it's growing and stuff, but in order for it really to survive, it would have to be paired with lots of other stuff, it seems to me. So I think one of the things that Jefferson was trying to do with the podium was pair it with a lot of other stuff. So there were other events going on there that animated this space, which I think I, I could even see piling more stuff onto that just to get the thing you know, lively and animated. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the intersection of the the urban strategy and the needs of this particular growing um, city, um, that uh, and the intersection with this technology as a kind of cipher into the status of the intersection of architecture and technology is a, is a very profound question. Um, and I, I think this this uh, context is is a is is a very um, fruitful place to be posing that question. Um, we're going to wrap up um, in a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to um, ask uh, whether there are any final uh, comments on the part of the jury before before we. Uh... Yeah, Jamie, I'd love to just spend one minute on sustainability, um, yes. which is a which is a thing that gets um, um, well, it's become increasingly 
um, critical um, to, to, to understand it and to, um, and to really um, anticipate the evolution of what we think we know of in terms of buildings. I mean, obviously buildings are one of the largest energy consumers in the world. And, you know, the, the kind of rage now is NFTs and Bitcoins and blockchains and all the energy that that takes to, to manage. And I'm kind of curious about your attitude about it. Not so much what you've done for your project, which you have a very nice diagram of. I'm sort of, I just want to ask one question. Is your roof sloping facing the east or is it, what direction is that facing? Um, facing east. Okay. Great. So, you know, you figured that out and the sustain in the photovoltaic panels and the solar thermal panels. But really what people are talking a lot about now is embodied carbon and operational carbon. And I'd like to sort of challenge you a little bit to think even beyond that. You know, when I was your age, there was this band called the Talking Heads. And there was this guy named David Byrne. And he wrote a song on an album called Naked. And one of the lyrics is, and this was a this was this was a parking lot. Now it's all covered with daisies. And really, as an architecture student, you know, kind of listening to those lyrics made me think about things because we weren't even talking about sustainable design, really. You know, it was the era of postmodernism, and it was, you know, that's how old I am. So it really was an eye opener to think about the future and how different it will be you know, from what we think it, and that whole song's about that. And, and, and it's about kind of the craziness of the Dairy Queens and the Pizza Huts all being gone and the dinosaurs kind of reclaiming the earth, right? So I think when you do this kind of thing, when you talk about sustainability and you talk about what the future is, and I, and I you know, I, I wanna say that it ties directly into kind of how you make the image of a building and how you make an architecture which is flexible enough, which has a lifespan that's long enough so that it can be changeable. And that's really a sustainable idea about, um, about building. And I, I think there's also a kind of idea about making an architecture that's sustainable by its image. In other words, that it drives people to wonder, like, I gotta go see that building in Tyson's Corner. It's like the new Eiffel Tower. It's uh, the new St. Louis Arch, you know, in a way, and I understand you didn't wanna do that, but there are some things about those buildings that you could call sustainable. So I, I kind of wanna challenge you to a kind of, rather than thinking about sustainability as, as only um, the kind of props for energy consumption, that you think about it really as an architectural idea. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, uh, I actually, uh, uh, Lindsay and I co-coordinated the thesis studio, but I also happened to have had the privilege of being Jefferson's uh, chair. And so, um, so in, in that role, I get a little bit of a, uh, a last word. Um, uh, Jefferson, um, if I were you, I would be thrilled by the dimensions of this dialogue concerning your project. Um, uh, when, we, when we talk about the status of, of architecture at the intersection of technology um, in all of the ways that, that uh, we've just touched on in this, in this dialogue, um, that, that is obviously a very profound um, uh, question and the fact that that your project has been a, a a vector, if you will, for those questions, I think is is absolutely uh, terrific. Um, Tyson's is a is a a an emerging uh, urban um, phenomenon. Um, full disclosure: our office is actually in Tyson's and. Um, uh, I can actually see Jefferson's uh, site. We had a couple of meetings where uh, I showed him my, my site from our office. Um, and, and therefore, the, the whole question of how technology uh, and building and, and event may, may enhance this, this notion of sustainable community um, as as some of the some of the questions at the end of this dialogue we're, we're beginning to 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 touch on, I think is is the other very profound question um, that your project raises. Um, uh, as as we were talking about this, I was thinking, you know, how would your 
the project in a way perhaps it's technologically um, quote unquote seep into the community. In other words, could it become distributed in a way? Um, and, and so uh, just so many uh, uh, really provocative questions coming out of this dialogue. So Jefferson, I want to, I want to congratulate you. Uh, it's been a great uh, ride. I've really enjoyed it um, and have enjoyed working with you and, uh, you know, hold on to, hold on to the, the dialogue. It's a superb, um, superb dialogue that your, your project produced and uh, you, should, you should feel very good about that um, indeed. So uh, thank you. Um, it's been a privilege and uh, um, congratulations to you. Thank you so much for everybody. Terrific. So um, we are uh, going to move right along. We have uh, three projects, as, as we said, and we're going to uh, now take a, take a look, at least initially, 10,000 feet to the new urban network of Southeast DC um, and Andrew uh, Cannings. So Andrew, uh, we're, we're ready to uh, let it roll. Hello. Thank you all for attending this thesis presentation on the new urban network of Southeast DC. Throughout this presentation, we will see a large scale design for the new urban network in this Southeast region that will hope to connect many of the different areas surrounding the existing metro stations, as well as looking into three different sites centered on three different existing metro stations, the first, being Deanwood on the orange line, the second being Addison Road, C. Pleasant on the silver and blue, and the third being Naylor Road on the green line. To learn a bit more about the history of these neighborhoods and some inspirational figures, here are those for Deanwood, mainly Nanny Ellen Burroughs, who founded the National Training School for Women in 1909, 10 years before women had the right to vote in this country. Another is Major Andrew D. Turner, who was commanding officer of the 100th Squadron of the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. And the last is Clarence Pendleton, who was the first Black chair member on the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights in the East. This is the view you see when you get off the Deanwood Metro Station today. Here is an image of what this view could look like in the future based on the exploration of this thesis. This is a view, again, of the Deanwood area, looking up the main thoroughfare of Minnesota Avenue. And this is what it could potentially look like based on the design implementations used and researched in the thesis. Moving on to our next site of Seat Pleasant, an inspirational individual you might be aware of, Kevin Durant, a famous NBA all-star, is from the area and has inspired many people, young and old, around the love of the sport as well as outside of the sport itself. This is a view looking on to see Pleasant Metro Station from a large parking garage on top. This is a proposed view for a community plaza that creates space for local residents to sell their goods and provide a local community economy as well as a thriving social atmosphere. This is what you currently see when you step off the Seat Pleasant Metro looking at this large parking garage structure which typically uses about 25% capacity pre-COVID. So a lot of the space is left unused. With this potential view, the parking structure itself is revamped and repurposed as a community center for the local residents, creating an active space for this plaza. Moving on to our Third site, Naylor Road, notable figures, starting with Tana Swan, who's a professional dancer, choreographer, as well as philanthropist, and Navarro Bowman, who's a successful NFL player. 
this view once you step off of Naylor Road Station currently versus a proposed view of substantial park space and commercial design around. This is a view of Naylor Road itself currently looking back down along the road towards the metro station itself and a proposed more urban setting with the urban structure itself framing the road and helping to calm traffic rather than allowing the traffic to spill into the area. Now that we've looked at some historical figures, we can move on to current demographics and statistics of the site. This page has a lot of information from unemployment to transit to education. Here are some of the outliers, starting with Deanwood, 45% unemployment in the area, 41% of the average household income is listed at $25,000 or less, and 19.1% of res residents are listed to have not graduated high school. Looking at Seat Pleasant Naylor Road, the outliers revolve around transportation with two thirds of the residents using personal vehicles to get either to work or school and only approximately 30% using public transit and 1% being able to bike or walk. In response to the research of the history and demographics of these areas, this thesis has produced the eight baseline needs. Again, there's a lot of information on these slides. The main takeaway here is that the three sites all work at different levels between these eight baseline needs that you can see on the screen now. Looking back onto our three sites, how they relate to both the metro system and the DC city fabric. This graphic shows the current transportation connections between Deanwood and Addison Road site. There are various public transportation options, but the major takeaway is that driving is the most efficient with approximately a 10 minute trip versus a 30 minute trip with the metro. A similar story here with Naylor Road, driving an estimated 15 minute trip versus 30 all the way up to 52 minutes. And finally, again, the same thread between the connection of Addison Road Seat Pleasant and Naylor Road with approximately a 30 minute driving trip, more effective than a 25 minute bus route. These stations here in this graphic show how they are connected through the current urban network system. This slide here shows the proposed plan for a vast streetcar system focused mainly in the center of DC, but with the dark green streetcar line connecting some of the wards in the southeast area. As a part of this thesis, taking the purple line in the top right area that currently will end in New Carrollton Station and extending it as a loop around the city through the southeast region of DC via rapid bus transit line to promote public transportation and take back some of the extensive vehicular infrastructure. And this final step in showing this new urban network as a part of the CSIS is an extensive bike trail system that will promote sustainability in transit and efficiency through bicycle versus vehicular travel. Moving on to the Dean Wood site and the specific designs around it. Major challenges relating to the baseline needs we looked at earlier revolve around these major points. And here is a graphic showing the current urban fabric of the site. And this is the proposed design as a part of this thesis. The main concept being creating a urban strip and density along Minnesota Avenue here. 
This graphic shows the different program that is used to create this space and this strip. Here we see some sustainable elements at work as well within this design. This view we've seen earlier can transform into this view showing the education center that could be inspired and named after Nanny Burrow and her very interesting and remarkable story. The massing of this also could frame the existing Long Brown High School in the community. And some call outs here show elements such as permeable pavers used in this large plaza, as well as streets with low speed to help promote the pedestrian use, as well as bicycle use in the area. This image along Minnesota Avenue becomes this very urbanized strip full of activity for the pedestrians with similar call outs, such as the prominent ground level retail that further helps to promote the walkability, as well as calming vehicular traffic that will still run up and down Minnesota Ave, use of punched in windows to help control solar gain and allow for higher R value within the walls themselves to help promote energy saving. And also the inclusion of cherry trees along the urban strip to help relate this area of DC to the central image along the mall that many of us think of when we think of DC. Moving on to the Addison Road Seat Pleasant site, or as I will be referring to it from now on, the Seat Pleasant site. Here are the major challenges, reverting back to the baseline needs, a major focus here being healthy food access. This graphic here shows the urban fabric as it sits now with the large parking structure working as kind of an urban sore thumb along the rest of the area. This proposed design shows the implementation of the rapid bus transit stop along the Sea Pleasant site, as well as creating the urban plaza for affordable retail use in the area. These images here show the first and second floor plan of the repurpose and reuse of the parking garage, the one on the left being the first floor plan, one on the right being the second. On the left, you see the ground floor is primarily a retail space, providing space for a 50,000 square foot grocery store, as well as a large community center, and the second floor providing offices towards the metro station to look over on the second story. Another diagram here showing how some of the sustainable urban aspects will be woven into this design. A major call out is the use of the current rooftop as a garden space for local residents. This image we've seen from above looking down onto the metro station becoming this lively plaza and certain call outs such as solar panels on top of the roofs of these new pavilions that not only help promote local retail, but could also power equipment used for the selling of those goods, as well as EV charging spaces to help promote sustainable transit, even for those who still rely on personal vehicles. Here we see an image looking on to what is currently a parking structure and what could become both a large community and youth center as well, promoting a sense of community and strong economic growth within the local community rather than large businesses in the area and the residents being forced to use those specific shops due to a lack of options, this space would be open to various amounts of public use and be flexible in its program while also providing a 
purpose for this space rather than parking a vehicle. And lastly, our final site of Naylor Road along the Green Line. Here you can see the major challenges involved relating to the baseline needs and the current urban fabric, which is very disconnected in the way of the road itself splitting and driving its way through this space. This thesis proposed not the Naylor Road, but the Naylor Village, a large project creating a variety of different spaces and a real place for one to live in a walkable home and community rather than having to be in a food desert or in a space with a lack of goods. Diagram here shows the different programs of this design, notably the western side being a commercial hub, which transfers into a strip of retail along the ground floor residential above into a purely residential area on the far right. And what is still notable here is the extensive parks and pedestrian only strips leading from the metro to the major park in the residential area. This park not only serves a community purpose, but also a sustainability one in helping to prevent the heat island effect, as well as stormwater management issues, which will be a part of a project at this scale. This view we've seen from the Naylor Road Metro can become an urban park view, taking the pedestrians and guiding them down to the urban strip while still creating a nice urban and commercial space around the metro station itself. This extensive parkland and permeability again with stormwater management and the heat island effect in mind. Looking down through Naylor Road becomes a much more urban space where the structure and the design itself helps to calm the traffic flow, still allowing four lanes of traffic to pass through the area, but not allowing the traffic to bleed over into the community itself. A major factor for this is the use of curbless streets where drivers naturally feel that they will drive slower due to the lack of curbs and allowing the space to be for the pedestrians and for the residents themselves. As a final graphic here, I'd like to end showing the hopes and goals for each site within the eight baseline needs. Major takeaways are the focus for metro and bus use throughout, the educational hub in Deanwood Station, the healthy food access in Seat Pleasant, and the commercial opportunities that you find throughout, as well as creating an affordable housing in a full community in a village design in Naylor Road. Thank you all very much. As well with these goals, I hope this thesis could potentially make steps towards a more sustainable urban life rather than a hard cutoff between an urban center and suburbia. I'd now like to open up this thesis discussion to questions and comments. Thank you all very much. Great. Um, thank you, Andrew. And if you can share your mural address in the chat, that would be great. And we will. Yep, I just send it open in it up. the chat, and then hopefully you can see the yep, mural right. board now. As a brief introduction, it's separated into what I've been calling five separate chapters. The first being the introduction and the new urban network, then the Deanwood site, Seat Pleasant site, Naylor 
village site, and then a summary of the overall network and impact along these sites. Great, thank you. So with that, we will uh, begin our dialogue. Everybody gets oriented on mural. Andrew, thanks for your presentation. I have a clarifying question for you. Um, the three sites now you're proposing to have a stronger bicycle network between them. Is that correct? Yes. Do you have, are you proposing a certain kind of new cross section of the street or is it just through using the existing infrastructure you would want to propose um, more dedicated bike lanes? Can you talk a little bit more about the, the larger urban scale between the stations? Yeah, of course. Um, so over the past few months, particularly with uh, the impact that COVID has all made on our lives, it also inspired and adapted this design, particularly the new urban network. Um, what we've seen in Washington, D.C. and many cities uh, across the globe, specifically in 18th Street in Washington, D.C., is with this pandemic, the people and the human scale really taking back the city fabric and the streets themselves. So in lieu of that, and in hopes for this new urban network being something that could be feasible, it would be taking over the extraordinary amount of space and infrastructure that we've dedicated to personal vehicles and allowing uh, an on-off lane to become a bicycle lane or uh, taking a lane and making it a uh, bus rapid transit to where making driving my personal vehicle not the most efficient method for getting around the city and specifically the Southeast region of DC would help promote sustainability in the long run. Yeah, I know, at least in San Francisco, they've definitely closed, they've called them clo uh, slow streets, where they've closed mm -hmm. them off to cars, and they even closed a portion of the California Pacific Highway that's along the beach just for pedestrians, which has kind mm -hmm. of transformed how we think about public space and, you, like, adapting infrastructure. And um, the reason why I ask is because you have three sites that are fairly far apart, um, but they're all existing you know, part of this existing transit network. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how the connections between can have some sort of identity to lead you from one location to the other. Can you talk a little bit more about sort of the, the architectural language between these sites? Yeah, so this project is um, much more towards the urban design scale than purely the architectural one, but the general idea was creating urban plans and urban contexts within each site that would promote the use of local materials. Um, in my renderings, I used concrete and brick as the major materials that both can be locally sourced in the DC area. And rather than that, specifically in terms of architectural design was with the Seat Pleasant um, Community Center and taking that existing parking garage and adapting three of the four floors to have different purposes for the communities themselves. Um, you mentioned that they were a bit apart there, more or less five miles apart from one another, which um, would be a bit of a bike, about 20 or so minutes given the proper infrastructure, bike trails and bike lanes versus having to dodge traffic or hop onto the sidewalk. Um, Andrew, 
I want to applaud you for tackling uh, uh, this issue. This is very uh, culturally entrenched. Um, I'm very familiar with the Deanwood side, not so much with the uh, Naylor Road or the Seat Pleasant, but there's a couple of things that I, I think I want to applaud you for, but there's also a couple of things that I, I think you might want to look at in a deeper way. And the one that glare, uh, grows out to me is that's kind of glaring is that you made a point to highlight some uh, significant personalities associated with each of these places, but mm -hmm. architecturally it didn't tra it didn't translate, right? So Kevin Durant, that's great, but how do you translate the celebrity of Durant, or how do you translate a, a Nanny Burroughs uh, to this urban space place making? And that's that's a that's a challenge. For I wish sure. that you this project. I wish this I wish this thesis project was done in combination with a social scientist, perhaps a sociologist mm -hmm. or, or a criminal justice person. This is this is one that could really gain from being a, a collaborative project with with someone outside of architecture that's really steeped in the community nature, because the success of this project is really going to be dependent on the process. Mm -hmm. the community involvement, the community process. Um, part of your spaces, for instance, this illustration we have on this uh, really um, is pretty bland. And when you think about the high crime rates that exist in these communities, it's a bit scary, especially if you envision this in the evening or at night. Uh, and so I think you might want to uh, even kind of excite your viewers by making your, your presentations much more lively. So what I would have advised you to do is, is to think about uh, a community celebrations here. Juneteenth comes in to my mind because that's coming up, right? If you go out, if you go to these communities on Juneteenth, you'll see a very different celebration and a space like this that you're proposing could be a, a great canvas for Juneteenth celebration. So you mm -hmm. might have uh, kind of envisioned or at least presented us uh, with illustrations of community celebrations where there's marketplace, there's dances, there's music, there's something that really kind of elevates this to, to instead of this a blank plaza with a few people in there. So part of the message is in the presentation. I think that, that I would encourage you to uh, think about. I, I, the other thing that some of the street uh, illustrations immediately raised the hair on my head, knowing that these communities are greatly af afraid or are fearful of gentrification. Mm -hmm. And so part of that in your, again, much of it is in your presentation, is how do you make these street scenes, see, scenes more uh, ownership of the community? Right? How does this become not a developer street scene, but a community street scene, right? And, and if you think about it, you probably have hung out in these communities. There's a lot of sidewalk street activities. A lot of folks hang out on the streets and they hang out not just in groups, but they hang out with music, they hang out with discussions. And what does that mean if you, if you you drew, if you showed us a street section of some of these proposals, where would people hang out to listen to music while they're sitting in front of the, uh, of the, of the stores or the shops that you have? So it really needs, I think, some, you have this larger viewpoint of what you want to do kind of in an urban planning uh, uh, situation, but there needs to be something that excites the community about what particular aspects that culturally ties to them would be part of this vision. Yeah, I fully agree and uh, really appreciate all the points that you had there. Uh, I certainly agree with the point of, this would have been a great thesis to have joined it with a, a social expert or a criminal justice expert because um, uh, I definitely took steps and researched the history and tried to elevate some of the um, historical or inspirational figures of the area in it, but there's so much more in depth that uh, I could definitely go and that'll be something that I definitely write about in my thesis paper in the next few weeks. 
I also would add, I don't want to take up all the time, but this this really kind of, I, I, I also want to add is a, a probably a more thoughtful, futuristic notion of what you're doing. That is to say, at least in, in many of these communities, uh, bike, bike trails and bike riding is, is perfectly great. But you're going to see more of, of mobile transportation, scooters and these motorized skateboards and, and so on. So thinking in the, in the kind of the present or in the tradition won't be useful. It really needs to think about the future. There's going to be driverless cars that's going to go up and down. Driverless cars, peopleless cars, what are, you, you know what I mean. And, and, and there's a different notion of parking. I mean, there needs to be a future kind of uh, take to, to, to your vision of this. So I want to totally, totally agree with Brad and Jennifer. I think those were incredibly important things for you to recognize. And I would go further. I would say that your project is not finished until you have done some things. Um, and I understand that it's an urban design project, but I think you cannot present an architecture without attending to the importance of that architecture and how it, its specificity um, is really, um, it's, it's an obligation that you have. You know, I grew up in New Orleans and I live in Brooklyn, and so, so that's the first point. I think you have to you have to address some some of some of the architectural uh, questions, and and you raise them by 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 diving into the history and some of the figures in the in these communities, which is really important. Uh, I, the second point I want to make is that I think that, um, and maybe it's just the way in which you presented this, but it you know I grew up in New Orleans and live in Brooklyn and. There are, there are highways that run through the communities in those places that have caused a division and caused um, a, a kind of tear in the fabric of the city um, that has led to segregation and has led to poverty and has led to inequity. And what I'm curious about, Andrew, is what is it that caused these problems to begin with? And are you being specific enough about the description of that? Because I think you know more than you're telling us. You've got these matrix here and you, it looks like every one of these communities has the same sets of, of issues, which I'm sure they do, but I'm interested in your research into what caused this problem to begin with. So that's the second kind of, of, of quick kind of thing I've, I think you have to answer before you can call it quits on this. So, so just again, I think, you know, kind of telling us what the basis of your, your findings is in a, in a more concrete way that's specific to these different communities, not treating them the same way, because it looks like you've got a solution that's, you know, come one, come all. But I think each of these communities and their figures are specific, and each of these communities and their solutions and their problems are different. And I think that you've done. Um, a little bit of a disservice to yourself by 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 grappling with or at least showing these things to be so similar in in not only the way in which you talk about the problems but the way in which you present the the architectural solution. So you know, yes, not being very clear, but that's I think important. There was a lot of uh, back and forth with um, showing these. Uh, specific sites with their own history and their own particular issues and potential solutions for them. They're all unique in their own way, but still making them feel like they could be part of a larger connected network in the future. And there was a lot of research that went into it that um, actually in my kind of midterm or practice presentation a month ago, I went into a lot more detail with and um, it kind of took away from the conversation. I had a lot of uh, 
critics recommend to try and summarize it a bit more succinctly and uh, your comment of making a, a blanket answer of what caused all this. Um, there isn't really one clear solution for that. It's the same, um, just amalgamation of issues that we see all over the globe and all over the country of racial injustice, social injustice, and how through the history of things like highways being used and tore through existing neighborhoods uh, that many of the time were minority communities. And then it was just easier to take a straight line through it. And then the less uh, hardship facing communities could then get to work five minutes faster. Uh, it was really the focus of this thesis was to provide for these underserved communities. And uh, I agree with the previous statement of the idea of the future could have been pushed further and making this less of what do they need now or what could these communities have in the future, but kind of renovating the area without introducing gentrification, trying to celebrate some of the, the local heritage and history of the sites, which again was something that I by no means tackled or successfully nailed, but um, it was definitely something that was researched and understood and talked about in how to make an urban design within these three different sites where Deanwood was an urban strip that focused on the educational issues that the area is really facing that was highlighted in the graphics. Uh, the bottom right, where C Pleasant is totally overrun by vehicles and they have this infrastructure for vehicles, but they're not utilizing it. And Naylor Road is this thoroughfare, a drive through of a space that just doesn't have the proper infrastructure for uh, community presence. And that was the creation of the village, was well, trying to separate and deal with the unique struggles of all three sites while still allowing them to become a part of a future urban network. I think the challenge you had, because you're it's super ambitious project in the sense mm -hmm. of um, the tackling three different areas. And um, I won't reiterate the comments that were made, but I, I feel like on the one hand, um, you might benefit from having a more clear explanation of the kit of part of the toolkit that you're using to address these things and think about that more as a set of strategies, which uh, while they might have a specific um, uh, implication for one or two sites are things that can be used elsewhere, whether it's tree, you know, tree planting or the definition of street edges or, and, and sort of, so I feel like that's just sort of pulling back and thinking about, you know, what are the, what are, um, architectural or planning strategies, you know, that, that uh, uh, can be used in different ways. The other one to me, I think what, what, I, what I like in some of the strategies that you're doing are one is using landscapes so having trees, you know, the tree line street, which, you know, one of the things that uh, a lot of urban neighborhoods lack, especially um, neighborhoods that are underserved, they don't have shade, you know, so there's no there's no, so, and that combined with, you know, vehicular traffic and other things, you know, has lower health, um, you know, just a poor health outcomes for people who live in these areas. And so I feel like, you know, that's something that's on the one hand more general, but then can be used in different, in different ways. I mean, the element that fascinates me the most, which I completely agree with Brad's comment, it's, it's the space that needs to be developed further is the marketplace space that you created in the seat pleasant project because i think and i keep thinking of richard sennett who's a really interesting urban planner and sociologist um, who who has written about spaces in um developing countries where there are places like this that are for exchange that are not uh that, that may have a commercial component but can also focus function for community connection and i think the the design of that space would be a really wonderful project in and of itself, both in terms of where do you locate that 
within the community so that it has maximum benefit and is safe, you know, has a sense of, of um, safety to it. And then the scale of it, the kind of um, elements that might need to be adjacent to it or part of it, you know, to make it function throughout the year or at all times. I think that's a really interesting um, uh, component of your thesis is that that sort of market space uh, for want of a better word, but I really, I like, I, I, and I'm not entirely convinced, you know, it's a location because if you located it behind the parking garage or to the east of it, it's not on a street. So I'm a little bit unclear as to how you actually get to it or, I mean, there's a parking lot adjacent to it, but um, it just, how can that be woven into the, the, the um, you know, the, the circulation systems of the community, you know, in different ways would be important to do. So I guess if I were to pick one area that I would say that's a kind of interesting invention that one doesn't see a lot of in, in urban areas, but would be a prototype that might have real benefit for the community, I would say focus on that. And then sort of then the architecture, yeah, is the, is the building, again, like I was saying in the first project, is it more of a kind of infrastructure? It's just defining the space and it's open sheds, which can be adapted in different ways like you have, or is there a component that, you know, as you, you show the retrofitting of the garage, it looks like to the side that you're putting some program in there. Is that right? That's the brick, bricked in area. Yeah, yes. In the background of that view, that perspective. So, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's a, an appropriate adjacent program or location of other activities there? Um, but I would, I would say, you know, or if you go further with the project, uh, just developing this idea, it seems like pretty fertile ground for um, kind of building community cohesion, serving the community, creating something that can function throughout the year. Um, yeah. For sure. It was definitely an interesting balance for, um, for this thesis for wanting to design in both the scale of an urban network that could connect not only just these three sites, but many of the sites in the region that are currently underserved and still getting into uh, enough detail to try and understand or design for the specific community itself. And there's certainly more work that can be done and pushed further and very much appreciate all the, all the comments thus far. Um, Professor Bell. Mute and I'll unmute and open the video. Um, Andrew is uh, put his finger on, you know, a couple of interesting things. Obviously we need to, maximize the infrastructure investment of transit and have people live near transit and that is to be commended and I think you know aside from the specifics of the comments about the placemaking that you see in the 3D images I find the strategies to be generally pretty straightforward and simple I mean I you know I, I quibble a little bit with the Deanwood strategy because the community center which I know a little bit about seems to be playing less of a role there, but maybe that's something you and I can talk about later, Andrew. Um, but um, uh, the, the thing, the challenge of these sites is that when the Washington Metro network was planned, these were all kiss and ride sites. So you had big bus infrastructure right up against them. And WMATA is still not in that place where they're willing to kind of move from the business of, buses converging on these places and sort of, you know, they, I always say when we do these transit plans that if the operations people or the, the ridership people could have their way, they would drive the bus right onto the metro tracks because they feel that when people get out of a bus, there's a chance that they lose a rider somewhere. So um, there's always that tension. And um, it is a difficult thing to navigate because so what you end up doing is trying to sort of pick your battles in these kinds of sites whereby where do you put the bus infrastructure because you still have to have it. And even if you do build density around them, how you manage the bus infrastructure so that it works, because that is an important part of ridership, getting the buses as close to the front door of the station as possible is, is still there. It's still something. And, and so, um, you know, uh, Andrew, when you, when you go to do these sorts of things, 
if you design a street, if you move the buses further away, the walk to the station has to be relatively short and a nice walk too, to be able to get there so that, so that um, people are encouraged through the placemaking also to ride transit. Um, you know, the, the, the most difficult one, I mean, Sea Pleasant, I don't know much about, but Naylor Road is extraordinarily difficult also because of the topography there. It's, it's not an easy station to design, but the idea of just sort of laying a grid around it and then just using the grid to sort of feather into the neighborhood seems to me to be a pretty good strategy, aside from what it looks like. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, are there other uh, uh, jury uh, comments uh, to begin to conclude our dialogue? Well, not hearing any, uh, Jamie, I'm gonna just step in as right. Andrew's chair uh, and summarize for Andrew here that um, you know, for the folks here today, Andrew sought to discover the unrealized potential in a series of uh, existing sites in the DC area and uh, wanted to also understand their potential connectivity to one another. And at the onset of the thesis, I, I think he was interested in the ways that we've rediscovered the potential of streets as, as a result of COVID. Not sure that that's entirely made its way into the uh, uh, the, the documentation in the thesis, but I certainly know in the mindset that was, that was the intention, the, the good intention of the thesis. And I, and I think um, uh, my, my colleague, Professor Grant has certainly uh, pointed that out, that, that that's an important thing to get into a life that might be supported by this, uh, these interventions. Now, the, the three sites required different strategies for analysis and design. And Andrew was more than willing to explore, explore that throughout the process. And I think the next steps might be to try to represent how his vision for these three places share things in common while at the same time developing their own distinct identities. Uh, and that also I think connects back to Professor Grant's comment uh, specifically about how you embody the memories of these aspirational figures uh, within the context of these places. Um, the buildings on each site seem too familiar, too similar, and, and somewhat familiar sometimes. They are almost as though they are from the very same palette. We've just kind of moved buildings around from place to place. And a few of them appear to me to be the sons of buildings that are located up the street from me up at the University of District of Columbia, the original buildings, which I would say avoid and concentrate on the newest building that's there, uh, the one by Michael Marshall, my friend. Uh, that has put a new face and a humane face onto the, the scale of the street of Connecticut Avenue in front of UDC. So I think the panel this afternoon realizes that the architecture and the uh, urbanism um, is a bit underdesigned and it is a bit generic and re requires perhaps a little bit more TLC than we've been able to give it up to date. Um, and perhaps a way for developing uh, the project a little bit further might've been to utilize a channel of input from the community's residents. Um, and might've been, you know, in hindsight, it might've been good to do what Christian did this morning on his thesis, which was to reach out via social media uh, to residents in his case in uh, El Salvador uh, and to gain input. Uh, and that helps us to sort of jog our own preconceptions about places and things. And, just concluding that I think one of the things that's really important to understand is that urban design is really consummately a social activity. It's not something that you do in an ivory tower. It's something that involves stakeholders. It involves really being understanding, intuiting and getting yourself woven into the hearts of the community, which again, during this particular period of time has been difficult. Uh, but I think that, the, that there are ways to overcome that. Andrew, I want to thank you for, for uh, bringing us through a, um, a semester of some uh, very interesting perceptions about the communities that you were interested in and uh, uh, sharing with us the challenges uh, of designing for those places. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Um, well done, Andrew. And thank you, everybody, for your 
uh, insight and comments. I think what we're going to do is um, uh, just give everybody a brief, uh, a brief uh, intermission, uh, but we will uh, start um, at 3.30 uh, sharp. Um, so between now and then, if you want to uh, 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 just uh, uh, take a brief break and do what you need to do, um, we will uh, start things up um, at 3.30 sharp, if not just a teeny bit before that. All righty. So we'll see you, uh, see you at 3.30. Sound okay, Lindsay? Sounds great. Good. I, I need a five minute break. Lindsay, are we broadcasting this afternoon on uh, social media? Indeed we are. Okay, just want to make sure I didn't see the live thing on the top of this. Oh, I can see it. Um, that's strange. Okay. You can't see it. And I just... Um, oh, yes, that's because I'm on my iPad again. Could be, yeah. Um, no. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we are. Um, I think uh, Fabian was in here pulling strings. I don't know if he's still in here, but yeah. Okay. He's in here, so... I think it's, he has, he's got it all automated for us. He's, he's a wizard, so thank you. Yeah. Good job. Good job.
Hey, Casey. Sorry, it took me a thousand tries to get the information. No, pro no problem at all. Happy to be here. Okay, cool. Um, and Andrew, is our other added wild card here? I don't see him in the room yet. Um, he mentioned he was going to sit in the audience. Um, ah. And yeah. Okay. But thank you for asking. I did extend the invitation. Okay. Yeah, he's totally invited. Okay. <clears throat> it is it is three thirty. So there we go. And I just want to double check first. I think everyone is mostly back. Um, is are there any jury people that we haven't introduced? Like any external jury people that uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. Cool. I just wanted to double check that there wasn't an external person new to the kind of community or conversation that we hadn't introduced. Sorry, Jamie, to interrupt. Go for it. Yeah. All right, um, we're, we're uh, reconvened and ready to uh, queue up our final project of the afternoon. Um, and uh, so without further ado, Andrew Mazur, uh, you'll be uh, presenting. Hello everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Andrew and this thesis is entitled Free Space, Envisioning the Low Earth Orbit Metropolis. The thesis posits a permanent free space settlement as a part of a space-based regional plan and the first steps in sustainable and ethical development beyond Earth. A systems-based strategy in low Earth orbit envisions an architectural stepping stone for humans to realize themselves as a multi-planetary species. Space hosts untapped resources and unrealized potential, and with increased interest in space exploration, it is imperative to plan for the consequences of what permanent settlement in outer space could mean for life on Earth. This thesis sets forth a strategy to ensure outer space and its resources are used fairly, responsibly, and justly, and access is promoted equitably, ethically, and morally to all who hold a stake in a collaborative human agenda. This presentation is divided into four pieces. First, I will define what a space settlement is, the foundational principles with which a space settlement could be built upon, and an ideal location for the first space settlement to be built. Part two will discuss the free space metropolis. The metropolis was fashioned in order to provide context for the space architecture interventions to take place at an urban scale and allows us to understand how earthly practices translate into outer space. Part three will cover the construction components used in the space architecture designs. And lastly, I will describe the free space neighborhood module and its amenities for the free space citizens. I will also highlight the design of human scaled habitats and show a glimpse into some day in the life events while living permanently in outer space. First, why investigate space architecture in space? Humans have always lived on the edge of a frontier that continues to be pushed further ahead by our explorative genes. Exploration and progress have been exponentially propelling civilization forward. These two points raise urgency among the stewards of the built environment to begin thinking about what the impacts of overcoming our current frontier will have on ourselves and our future endeavors. Is there a space crisis? Are there too few built environment stewards discussing the future of the built environment in locations other than Earth? Is it problematic that private wealth is setting the stage for the rest of the world to follow? This thesis makes a case for why developing a responsible approach for our use of outer space is important for everyone. This thesis posits a solution along this new space architecture paradigm to positively impact life on Earth. How does architecture fit into the tra trajectory of progress? It begins with our ability to realize habitat. The primitive hut illustrates the beginning. This is human's natural reaction to constructing habitat in the effect of gravity. Then, platonic forms are derived 
and push architecture innovation to express great structures like the dome and the arch, aiding the progress of civilization. Buckminster Fuller explores the application of these photonic forms in the absence of gravity. He gives us tensegrity and hyper-efficient architecture like the Damaxian house. Then we can realize architecture's existence in outer space and designing architecture solutions in zero gravity environments. This is the grammar of form and tectonics for space architecture throughout this thesis. The space metropolis is a compilation of space habitats, which in this case amount to a space settlement. If a space station is a work habitat and a space hotel perhaps a work and a play habitat, then a space settlement is a life cycle habitat where one is born and dies. What is space architecture? Space architecture supports the human experience while protecting them from the hostile environment of outer space and supporting their safety and well being within the constructed habitat. The habitat is always in constant dialogue with human activities and meeting the high demands of human comfort. What is the space habitat? The inward focused architecture places emphasis on the user's interactions within a clearly defined and contained system. Again, the meaningful aspects of function live in constant dialogue between the spatial nature of the architecture, the biology of the users, and the modular technology, which is an extension of the space architecture that is used by the inhabitants to maintain productivity. The goals of the low Earth orbit metropolis explore architecture, planning, and governmental policy as, a built as the built environment migrates to outer space. The principle of exploration aligns with many of the world's space programs, such as NASA. The cooperation principle demands partnerships at the global scale for space planning, space government, and space policy. There will be new resources to be extracted and processed for human use in space and on Earth. The low earth orbit metropolis will provide a place for new research and educational methods and platforms to propel all fields of study because of the diverse collection of individuals that would be required to maintain a sustainable settlement. And lastly, the low earth orbit metropolis will harbor innovations for living in and exploring spaces, exploring space and push human civilization deeper into our current frontier. Furthermore, low Earth orbit is one of the only places where humans have built and lived off Earth. The International Space Station has been consistently inhabited by humans for over the last 20 years. The proposed low Earth orbit metropolis positions itself as a literal and figural stepping stone to bridge humans' journey into deep space. This is the site of the proposed metropolis in low Earth orbit, or free space, physically untethered to any celestial body. The free space metropolis is located between 500 and 550 kilometers in altitude. The International Space Station is located between 400 and 450 kilometers just beneath. Here, we are close to home, much closer than Mars or the moon, and we are protected from harmful solar radiation, but high enough to maintain orbital velocity. The metropolis will orbit the Earth along the Earth nadir trajectory tracing the equator. This orientation positions the Earth beneath your feet, creating a constant connection to your home planet. Here is the 200-year Earth Network Master Plan. Space has already been populated with satellites and habitats. The free space metropolis will exist among the current and future space outposts and satellites, building what I'm calling the Earth Satellite Network. By the completion of the metropolis, we could expect networks of spacefaring outposts among networks of other celestial bodies, such as our closest neighbors like the moon and Mars. These networks allow for the planetary exchange of goods, products, and ideas, creating the beginnings of spacefaring economies. Uh, now on to the metropolis. Welcome. After your sixth eight hour flight on your commercial spacecraft, you're ready to land in the metropolis spaceport. The spaceport is like an airport for spaceships where you will be received similarly to arriving at an airport on Earth. The metropolis has two spaceports in pink. They're located at the front and the rear of the metropolis. Your flight arrives at the forward spaceport, which is reserved for private, commercial, and leisure travel. The rear spaceport will be used for freight and commercial shipping. These are the gateways on and off the metropolis. The spaceports are connected along the metro rail and infrastructure spine in white. Along the spine are PV for power generation in purple and radiators in brown for habitat exhaust. Flanking the main thoroughfare 
and pairs are the artificial gravity neighborhoods, which we will explore shortly. Like earthly cities, the metropolis has its own metabolism, consuming imports and expelling exported products and goods. The low earth orbit metropolis has the infrastructure to support an economy to participate in multiplanetary trade. The major street grid of the low earth orbit metropolis is organized such as that of New York City. Large primary avenues connecting from front to back and secondary cross streets branching out to each neighborhood module. The initial metropolis is approximately a square mile in size. The Washington DC mall and a three by three grid of New York City blocks are shown for scale reference. The free space neighborhoods fit within a TOD radius of one another and are laid out into units more efficiently than Clarence Perry's neighborhood unit model. The initial metropolis will accommodate six neighborhoods in order to achieve a sustainable population of about 10,000 people. When it is time for the metropolis to expand, growth can occur in all directions, giving it ultimate flexibility as it sprawls. It can grow incrementally until it finally encircles the earth and becomes a ring city in its final phase. Lastly, these are the artificial gravity neighborhoods that long-term space dwellers will inhabit. These neighborhoods rotate to create artificial gravity environments unlike the rest of the metropolis, where one would experience microgravity or total weightlessness. Each neighborhood is 320 meters in diameter by about 300 meters in length and located along the main boulevards that connect to other programs in the metropolis. It is important that neighborhoods rotate in opposite directions for counterbalance. As we move along the Metro Rail from the spaceport, we arrive at the neighborhood modules. The Metro Rail connects to the radial axis of each neighborhood, which supports the structural hub for the neighborhood. The neighborhoods are comprised of some basic building components. I'll break down each of those building components one by one and then aggregate them back together. A combination of two construction methods will be used to construct the low earth orbit metropolis. On-site construction and prefabricated construction techniques will be considered. The primary structural armatures of the metropolis can be 3D printed with the help of transastrous 3D printing satellites. The structural armature will be comprised of metal trusses like that of the International Space Station. Raw materials for these structural members may be mined and processed from lunar or asteroid regolith, making them locally sourced and offering new definitions for sustainable practice and low embodied energy construction materials. Imported construction components arrive via industry standard spacecraft. Currently, the largest payloads happen to be SpaceX's Falcon Heavy and the Starship Super Heavy. Construction components and crew are packaged within the rocket payloads and then deployed once the payload reaches the construction site. Prefabricated trusses can be lightweight and can be collapsed to conserve space for transportation. Their efficient use of material minimizes their weight for transport, but would not sacrifice their structural integrity. The collapsible truss armature can be combined with the inflatable habitat to provide an additional structural integrity for mounting floors and walls and carrying equipment. This additional structural design allows modules to gang together to form the neighborhoods. The inflatable habitat module is adapted from the Bigelow Olympus 2100. It is used to efficiently capture large amounts of habitable volume and is the fundamental building block to accommodate habitable programs within the low earth orbit metropolis. This membrane can be packed up and transported within the rocket payloads and then deployed on site for assembly. Two basic inflatable habitat prototypes were explored. The main difference comes from how they are oriented once installed. The shape of their floor plates and the number of available levels provide flexible design opportunities to address different programmatic challenges in artificial gravity environments. This allows the design to accommodate a variety of human demands to address human comfort and productivity. Lastly, the safe havens are proposed to join the inflatable habitats together. These prefabricated connector nodes are emulated from the International Space Station connector nodes and laboratory modules. Their interiors come fully outfit with NASA standard racks and are ready for immediate use after installation. These are used in the design proposal as connectors between the inflatable modules and as emergency airlocks between habitats for egress. They also aid in managing and connecting life support systems throughout the neighborhood. 
Here's what a simple aggregation of these building components might look like along the 1G radius of the rotating neighborhood. The axially oriented module is the most comfortable for human habitation. The radially oriented module is the least comfortable because of the round plan, but walls and interior design adjustments can be made to begin to address this. All floor plates will be contoured to follow the curve of the 1G rotational radius to optimize human comfort as they move about the habitats. Every habitat module has access to at least two other safe havens in case of emergency. Now, I'm going to explain how those, ag how those components aggregate into the free space neighborhood. So this is a typical artificial gravity neighborhood module. Free space offers an advantage over developing on the moon or on Mars because there is no gravity. Therefore, artificial gravity is proposed to maintain high levels of human comfort. As the neighborhood rotates at two rotations per uh, minute, enough centrifugal force is created to mimic gravitational environments uh, like that on Earth. Therefore, different floor levels will experience different gravitational environments because of the relative rate at which you change elevation. Wayfinding techniques will respond to floor levels ascending and descending away from the 1G level, which is equal to one Earth gravity. Here is a sample of how gravity changes as one ascends or descends in elevation along the habitable modules. As you ascend from the 1G level, the effects of gravity will decrease, making things relatively lighter. As you descend from the 1G level, the effects of gravity will increase, making things relatively heavier. Here is the first phase in, in the construction of the neighborhood. Construction occurs symmetrically to ensure the neighborhood remains in balance as it rotates to create artificial gravity. Wayfinding techniques like color coding these sectors corresponds with the construction phases. You will see later how these wayfinding techniques are deployed throughout the neighborhood. Each sector could take about five to 10 years to construct. The more we build in space, the better and faster we will become at it. After about 15 to 20 years, the torus is complete and the neighborhood can begin to expand outward to create an optimal aspect ratio. The next phases allow the torus to grow wider and wider until an optimal form is reached over the duration of about 50 years. Recall the neighborhoods are paired on axis with one another and two will be needed to will need to be constructed simultaneously. And as we ride the Metro Rail into the neighborhood station, here is what we will see. From the Metro Rail station platform, we can see the incoming and outgoing cabs and the exposed view of the ground level of the neighborhood rotating around us. We are still in a microgravity environment until we use the Metro Rail lift to descend to the ground level of the neighborhood. Here's the lift shown in section integrated into the hub and the structural spokes of the neighborhood. Lift cabs will slowly descend to the ground level of the neighborhood. As we descend, we experience the familiar sensation of weight returning to our bodies and slowly pulling our feet to the ground. The Metro Mover lift station could look something like this. When we exit the lift to the lift station, we find ourselves within the central civic junction to the neighborhood. Six different paths lead us in different directions to different civic and publicly programmed modules and thoroughfares within the neighborhood. In order to design and understand the layout of the neighborhood, conventional plans were derived from the flattening of the neighborhood module. A figure ground can be explored to show the connections among different modules and then programming circulation and zoning challenges can then be addressed. A typical neighborhood plan might look like this. The lift stations are in bright pink, and there are two, and they act as the center points for each hemisphere within the neighborhood. The lift stations are surrounded by public and civic programs like the forum, a school, and a hospital. Further out are the neighborhood cooperatives where communal residential housing is closely linked with agriculture and open spaces. The neighborhoods are designed to be walkable and provide a comfortable social public experience. Again, the flattened neighborhood plan fits well within a walkable TOD radius, allowing one to walk around the circumference of the neighborhood in less than 10 minutes. The major public thoroughfares are oriented in the direction of the neighborhood's rotation. The main public thoroughfare is positioned along the 1G level outlined in orange and moves through various module types. Habitable modules capture vertical space above or below the datum of the 1G level. 
These spaces are semi-public and are shared among the residential quarters, offices, or cooperative community, community common spaces. As we move from the lift station along the public thoroughfare, we can note offices within the vertical modules lying the main thoroughfares. The vertical modules are programmed like typical vertical apartment apartments, offices, or dormitories on Earth. Circulation and infrastructure lines the central core while dwellings and office spaces populate the exterior, reserving views for the users. These modules have the option to be flexible to accommodate different programs such as offices, laboratories, or luxury apartments. Nearby is the public forum. Here, delegates and diplomats from the nations of the earth and other planetary sovereignties can meet. The forum can be used to organize functions relevant to local matters within the low earth orbit metropolis. Back out along the thoroughfare, we might encounter some astronauts making their way to or from work, dog walkers and children playing as we move towards the next large public space. The neighborhood is complete with entertainment, recreation and leisure activities. The exploitation of having control over different gravitational environments can be advantageous to accommodating unique human experiences that are otherwise unavailable or impossible to achieve on Earth. By creating different gravitational environments, elderly and rehabilitation patients can live comfortably in environments with less gravity and experience less resistance on their bodies, while athletes can work out in higher gravitational environments with added resistance. Continuing back through the neighborhood, I want to take you to a typical neighborhood cooperative where daily life is supported by and centered around what I'm calling the lung module. Living in space offers a unique cooperative opportunity among the inhabitants. Among you are fellow co-op and your fellow co-op are your fellow co-op living mates. They range in age, household size, and professional expertise. You will be living with folks trained as astronauts and pilots and engineers with skills to keep the metropolis in working order. You will also be living among teachers and farmers that are required to maintain a functional society. There will be children playing and running through the open green spaces and retired seniors taking advantage of microgravity therapy for their aged bodies. There is a unique eclecticism to the intentional social demographic in order to support the sustainability and longevity of a space community. The co-op is designed around the lung module. The lung is a piece of infrastructure as well as a spatial reprieve for relaxation and leisure. A large open greenhouse-like space full of vegetation and daylight. Variations of the lung are proposed to maximize biodiversity within the neighborhoods to provide residents with a variety of agricultural options. The lung is essential to maintaining sustainable life support systems for the residents. All living things operate within a closed loop system. There is no waste. Waste is the fuel used for growing agriculture and vegetation. Vegetation provides renewable sources of breathable air for human beings living in the metropolis. The oxygen diaphragm circulates air to the nearest habitat modules. PV panels at the base harvest sunlight and convert its energy into power, which is then provided to all the other modules for use. Black and gray water is also recycled and purified to provide portable drinking water. The lungs also regulate the humidity and control airflow across the habitat modules. Radiators at the top process excess humidity into energy and exhaust heat. Each co-op has a communal kitchen with views overlooking the lung. The kitchen is where, the is where community is shared around the food grown and the water produced in the lung spaces. There are two different housing configurations based on the orientation of the modules in order to create housing flexibility as families grow and shrink. Both configurations separate the private dwellings from a centralized circulation core not to inhibit the contiguous circulation network around the co-op and the neighborhood. The top level of the vertical modules could be reserved for a semi-private garden space or rooftop terrace to be shared among those living in the housing module. The condos are situated within the horizontal modules and are split level to accommodate the circulation and infrastructure core. Private apartments like this one could also be inserted into the vertical module and introducing walls, as mentioned earlier, can ease some of the negative effects of discomfort that come from the round plan as many as four dormitories can be fit onto one floor plate. The interior walls 
house the utility and plumbing, and double as radiation shielding in the event of emergencies. The apartments are outfit with modern amenity and provide the inhabitants with views of the lung spaces and outer space. Space architecture is no longer the thing of science fiction. Right now, we are living among many driven people who also aspire to see humans as multi-planetary inhabitants. This thesis envisions the possibilities of comfort, adventure, and excitement through the lens of architectural design and careful planning. Since the inception of space travel, the domain of outer space has always been reserved for use among all people. Through these guiding principles, space exploration and development can benefit all of humanity and help resolve the issues we are currently facing on Earth, but not without the input and cooperation from all of Earth's global citizens. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to discussing this topic further. Terrific. Thank you, Andrew. And the neural link is in the uh, in the chat now. And you'll be sharing your mural directly. Hello. Thank you. Um, yes. Well, I made comments in other projects about infrastructure. I think you've proposed the ultimate infrastructural uh, <laughs> project. Um, and uh, I mean, incredibly, you know, uh, thorough, detailed exploration of this subject, which is just, you know, mind blowing in the levels of, you know, kind of invention and, and uh, you know, detail that you've gotten into. So um, kudos to you for, for that. It's, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, I, uh, you know, and I, I'm sort of pulling it back to my, you know, earthbound notion of architecture. So in terms of, you know, uh, issues related to hierarchy, you know, and, and, and systems of relationships, you know, which you're articulating and developing in these. And, and I think they're there and they're good. I guess the parts that, you know, and, and then I'm also, you know, kind of thinking about the uh, extremely um, maybe um, no longer relevant, you know, sort of Vitruvian triad, you know, of the firmness, commodity, and delight, and 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 maybe that doesn't apply anymore to this. But I, I, the parts of your project that excite me in a way the most are the ones that are where you have the metaphor, or where you like the lung, or the the kind of where where does one find the delight? You know that that there's this actual transformation from either the aggregation of elements or the the the, the inventions that you've made in the project. Um, so those are the things that I'm kind of most attracted to because um, to take nothing away from, from, from the you know, entire system that you've created, but I feel like in those areas, then it starts to suggest what a way of, you know, what the payoff is, I guess, you know, because uh, if one assumes that technology will make all this possible and that you know, the kind of careful, thoughtful, um, you know, a holistic uh, integration of technology and, and, and to think about it from a people, you know, human perspective as well, which you've done is, is all there. I kind of want that, that just to see more of the kind of, you know, revelatory, aside from the fact that this thing would be insane as a kind of belt wrapping earth. So, I mean, yes, that's like, again, mind-blowingly revelatory in the sense of what that is. But I guess, you know, in a future where maybe anything is possible and human beings can do whatever they want, then you kind of want to pull back and be like, so then what is the motivation to maybe speak to your ideas about community or, or um, a kind of vision of a sort of ideal society or something, which again, that, that has maybe a formal implication or a, uh, a kind of implication that transcends, you know, the kind of um, beautiful, but, and I don't mean this in a negative way, the but, but the kind of highly functional relationships between parts. So I sort of want to see that that's the part that I think would then, you know, compel people to want to actually build this, you know, that because it offers so much more than just the, um, the, the kind of um, integration, you know, uh, and, and sort of um, systems integration and sort of problem solving. So. 
I don't know if that makes sense or not. And I think the, it's all there, but then I kind of want to know, you know how do you push it? And I also think about there, there are these amazing images from, you know, the fifties and sixties and seventies of, you know, rotate and of course, 2001 space odyssey and these other visions about living in outer space. And so I kind of want to place it within those as well. Like, are there actual fields being, you know, uh, crops being grown here? Are there, you know, just what, how do you, how does this transcend some of which I feel like it is, is your implementation of kind of the known technologies, you know, which are these sort of modules and modular construction and you're just scaling them up to a much larger scale, but then what's the, you know, at what point does that scaling up create an entirely new thing that is a sort of, um, yeah, architecture with a capital A, I guess. <laughs> that's what, those are the questions I'm having. This is, that's what it raises for me at least. Yeah, I think, thank you for those comments. I think there, what, what, I've, what I've seen in a lot of the space architecture, I didn't know space architecture was uh, as prevalent of a field um, as it is until I embarked on, on this thesis journey. Um, and, and that's been really cool. But one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of the research is there's, um, and alluding to some of the, maybe some of the, the projects that you've referenced from the, the 70s, there's these really large macro structures, um, uh, sometimes miles, miles long, and the feasibility of those seems really outlandish, but then there's also like tried and, and proven prototypes and, and things like the International Space Station, right, that are much smaller, but but work. And I think uh, one of the biggest driving points for me was trying to, you know, make make that gap. There's there's a lot of pieces in in this space architecture toolbox that are that are there and, and that are available. And it was it was kind of like a, for me a puzzle trying to what what did I need to put together in order to achieve um, you know something at the scale of a neighborhood. Um, and something to the point where it could it could be self-sustained um, and, and things like that. Um, one of I, I will say one of the hardest parts was finding a way to contextualize um, the architecture because in space there's you know it's a vacuum there's there's nothing there. Um, so the you know this this kind of metropolis model that you see on the, the left hand side that that's borrowed um, but that gave me the opportunity to explore um, the the kind of more human scale architecture of the neighborhood and and the habit like you know living habitats um, because I had something to kind of you know ground it in uh, so to speak um, but yeah I hope I hope that that helps a little bit well, it has to do with, I mean, I guess what I think about in those sort of um, uh, agglomerations of elements is, you know, again, maybe how do they build communities or what do they suggest that so that the individual elements, you know, co uh, cohere into something that's larger. And one of the challenges you have with the, the model you're using or the techniques is that essentially people are always inside of, of units that are, um, other than maybe for the lung elements that are sort of um, tube-like or they're sort of truncated and you know, they're like sort of sausage casings or something or so they're sort of so you the, the scale issue you know you get the scale the larger scale but it's not a scale that people can actually inhabit right it's about the rotational distance needed you know to create neutral you know to to, uh, to create gravity um, that's what determines the dimension which is interesting you know in terms of but um and maybe experiential experience is defined differently in your project than as to maybe lines of sight or apparent, you know, um, distances so that you can, it is legible maybe to a person in one of the smaller units that there is this larger, you know, circular structure that you're within. But um, uh, yeah, or I think about, I mean, other, you know, earth earthbound places like, you know, um, uh, Arco Sante or something, and people have these visions of kind of, uh, cities that are or just rethinking the sort of cellular nature of, of a city uh, 
what constitutes a, a, a grouping of, of elements to make a kind of place for you know masses of people to live. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, it's really intriguing. There's a lot of interesting questions, and, and um, I think the crux of it again for me, just to get back to my initial comments, just about how does the how do all these systems and relationships and hierarchy contribute to something that um, uh, transcends maybe the individual elements which constitute them? I see how it does it in a functional way, and you know, mm -hmm. because of the necessity for rotation and whatnot, uh, and for just creation of the larger scale. But I, I guess I mean it in a more um, transcendent way, you know, as a uh, a place that you would call home. Um, mm -hmm. And that would offer something beyond the scale of the individual elements. Thank you. Hey, Andrew, um, I really appreciate your presentation. I'm super excited um, about your project. It made me want to go watch some sci-fi movies later tonight. Um, the reason why is because I think you were so thorough in the representation, the diagrams, the drawings. It was you were so meticulous about all the little things and. Um, I appreciate that kind of rigor. Um, in terms of sort of the infrastructure of it, I really like the sort of, what did you call it? The anti-gravity neighborhoods, those little, um, each of those cylindrical pods as a network, mm -hmm. I think is really strong. But when I look at the interior images, I think there's kind of a struggle of what we know in, on Earth and what can be possible out there. And oftentimes in architecture and space architecture, that's usually explored through cinema. Um, mm -hmm. As Adam mentioned, 2001, uh, Star Wars, other things like that. But I'm wondering if the interiors, if that could take another sort of re-examination of what is the, the new palette for the material quality of those sort of capsule-like interiors um, because you know you have your your standard floor mop sign you have a standard table and you know I just think that there could be a little bit more discovery and fun in what these different cells mean um, and even thinking about the legibility of moving through this whole system right like I, I worked on the Apple campus building being able to like understand what pod you're in relies a lot on signage, but can architecture, can the interior capsule have differences in the cross sections that you know there's an identifiable sort of relationship of I'm in capsule A versus capsule J. Um, and so maybe there's something in the, the post J of the cross section that can start to <laughs> change things up a bit. Um, but I agree that the lung itself is sort of where these capsules are or sort of uh, orbiting around, I think is a really strong part within the neighborhood organization. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I totally agree. Um, the, a lot of the, and, and as you can see from some of the plans even, um, there's rather conventional furniture stuck inside a round plan, um, which um, from what I've researched goes against everything about efficiency that um you know space architecture is is sort of directed towards um so the interiors um you know if if there were four more weeks right um that was that would those are are things that i would hope to get to um to like you said give each one of these um Kind of unique programs, um, a unique, more unique um, architectural representation. Wow, <laughs> uh, this is one project you don't need a North Arrow. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's an amazing project. I really appreciate it uh, from from the presentations to the graphics to some of your investigations um, to your imagination. I think this is uh, incredible. Um, uh, boy, it seems though, I, I, I like it. I think this is fantastic. A nice, uh, a nice imagination 
And previously, I talked about a futuristic vision of architecture, and you, you've capped that for sure. Um, um, but it seems like the, many of the spaces are very generous, right? When I think about the efficiencies that are necessary for space, that you 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 really given the spatial dimensions a nice human scale and so on, but they're very very generous, I would think, from and, and from an engineering standpoint, getting getting that up there in space and putting putting it together. It also harkens to me the you know, not so much the architectural implications of this, but all the other implications, the, uh, the social implications, the political implications, all those kinds of things that this, this, this project begs for. And I know that's not part of your thesis, but that, that really compels me to think about some of these other implications uh, uh, of this. And it also had me wondering about this idea of form follows function. Right, you have the strong symmetry, but you address that by saying you needed that balance for all this, all this to work. Um, we don't really need to have a pretty architecture on the exterior, right? This is unlike on Earth where we see buildings from the outside. This is not really meant to be seen from the outside, but it's really an interior. This, the architecture starts to work for people from the interior. So I think some of the suggestions or comments that Jennifer was, is saying is, is interesting. Uh, you know, I was wondering as you were presenting, uh, why do we have to have gravity? Why, why can't this colony be uh, without gravity? And what would the implications of having a, a settlement, a non-gravitational uh, non settlement, and what would be the implications of, of the space and the interiors if this was designed without gravities? And we know that people can exist, that, that humans can exist without gravity. That's not, that's not a, a, a necessity for settlement. It's a necessity perhaps for comfort, although mm -hmm. I guess the folks in the space station have claimed they're very comfortable. Uh, without ga gravity, so so that was the question. How would this change if it wasn't if it if it wasn't uh, your purpose to put gravity to this? Uh, thank you, Brad. Um, I think the short answer to that question is we don't. Well, at least in what I've been able to see in in some of the research is that we don't know what prolonged um, effects of living in in microgravity due to our, our human body. But, um, you know, it, it kind of, it kind of gets into the ter territory of, of mutation and, and almost, I don't want to say aliens, but, you know, the, there, it, there's a, a biological, con there could be a biological consequence to um, living in, in, uh, you know, not Earth gravity environments for prolonged periods of time. Um, another, but I think another form, another form, another form of evolution, perhaps. Per, perhaps, yes. Um, and then I, I think this also, you know, this also gets into some of the uh, comments you raised about the generosity of space and the in interior design. The uh, these the precedent that I used for for developing these spaces um, is, it, you know, it, it is, was developed in a way in which it could house all of these extra pieces of equipment um, and, uh, you know, functional modules. But uh, in a gravitational environment, you no longer need some of the same equipment and, and pieces. So it frees up some of the, or, or I guess it would provide more opportunity for um, more designable space within the, the habitats um, because you would have less, you, you know, you, you don't need to worry about um, the, the lack of gravity. When you also, though, um, when you are in a, a gravitational-less environment, um, there is more opportunity to use um, kind of more more of the spaces. So if you think of like 
storage, right? We, we keep our closets and the walls, but in a microgravity environment, you know, you could, you could use the ceilings and the floors for things like storage and, and equipment and, and modules and things like that. But once you kind of change the context and put that into an environment with, with gravity, it, I suppose um, that becomes a little less intuitive in terms of design, design, at least that's kind of how I viewed it. But, um, but I, I think these are, are great points you, that you raise. Thank you. So Andrew, this is an extraordinary um, project and you, you know, you've kind of left nothing undone here. So I, before I say anything else about your project, I really want to commend you for the comprehensiveness of your examination. Um, you know, and, and I, th I think others have said this too, it's, it's, it's such an impressive way in which you've, you've research this and laid everything out. So, I, you know, I, I really want that to be the first thing that you hear. Um, Thank you. And it, it, for, for me, I, I, you know, so many thoughts ran through my head as, I, as you were describing this sort of idea of futurism in your early studies. And, um, you know, immediately thought back to 1955 and Mies and, and what Mies van der Rohe was trying to do. And, um, and how and how sad it was that it ended up with fake I beams on the outside of the Seagram's building, and you know, in a way, I think this question about what is the future of architecture on this trajectory that you that you are trying to divine, um, you know, brings up. And 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 so I will also like like Brad sort of wonder a little bit about what's happening back on Earth. You know, is it Mad Max? Um, you know, when, 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 Google, when Google and Amazon are running the space station and everything's hunky-dory and there's universal income, what's happening back on, you know, where are the poor people? And you brought up New York City and where is Times Square in your project, right? Or is there none, right? So that's, that's a kind of important question for you to grapple with is, and I think um, others talked about, you know, Jennifer brought up the idea of differentiation and specificity. And, you know, is, is, is this sort of a suburban idea about you know your thing being just exactly like the neighbor so that's the kind those are the kinds of questions that I was thinking of when you were describing the project and and as I look at your your storyboard there's a kind of wonderful answer to me um, and it has nothing to do with the morphology of the buildings um, it has more to do with light um, and color and and the idea of gradient and more of a subtle way of of divining a language for the future architecture. Um, there's, there's an article by Karen Stein called um, The Plain Beauty of Well-Made Things. And it's, it's a way of describing um, uh, minimalism, Donald Judd's idea about, um, we, we all think of his work as being minimal and Adam knows this better than anybody because he worked on the foundation, but that essay describes an appreciation of engineering and of a kind of, of a, an appreciation of just extremely well-made things. Just because they're well-made, they have a kind of intrinsic value. And I think that where the, the, the architecture of the future is headed for you is in, is in divining this gradient, this subtle variation through the exact precision of the making of things that people are surrounded by. So when I look at your storyboard here, I see this beautiful variance of color that's, that's finding its way through. And, and I think that is enough. You know, I'm, I'm sure that light is different in space. I don't know what that is, but you do probably. You talked about, you know, there's not a circadian rhythm or anything that I think you could get into but I think you could divine a kind of way in which light in space strikes the surface of a material. And that might almost be enough of a language to create a gradient that would be your own identifiable thing. Over in my neighborhood, we have this kind of orangey light that strikes and, you know, so I, I, I just kicks off a wonderful um, set of opportunities and thoughts about the next thing that's out there. But I think that you're just tinkering around the edges of the question a little bit because you've been so busy with this comprehensive exercise. But I think you need to take 
that question extremely seriously because we are at a turning point with a pandemic and with social issues that the way they are, we will change architecture because this happened in the 30s and 40s with wars on our planet and this whole time that we're in, you will see. And so architects like you will make a language for us to move ahead with. So thanks again for a great presentation. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Fantastic. Um, before we uh, turn it over to uh, Andrew's chair, um, are there uh, uh, final uh, uh, summary comments from, from, the, from the jury, from the faculty? Yeah. Um, hi, this is Mireya. I'd like to chime in. Andrew, fantastic project. I did not know what your topic was until it flashed on my screen, and I'm so glad I didn't miss it. Um, I think you've done a comprehensive amount of work here, which is sort of like, where do I begin? I'm a big science fiction nerd, and seeing how you're sort of taking this thesis, which sort of removes it from the known paradigm of architecture as we know it, right? And you're sort of like postulating what could happen in the future. I think as some of the jurors had mentioned, what you're creating here is sort of like a one-way street. It's sort of like once you sort of go to the station and the effect of living without gravity and all that potential mutation that might happen as a result over like a thousand years of living, you know, on a non-earthbound surface, the dialogue becomes something completely different. Your sensory perceptions becomes different. The idea of aesthetics is thrown out the window. Like it's now a new thing. And I think a lot of science fiction movies have tried to sort of imagine what that future is like, but they're still doing it within an earthbound sort of postulating, right? Um, I think, you know, when you think of like the humans that might be living or inhabiting this station, the thing, the first thing that came to mind when you were talking about your project is like, oh, wow, we're already starting to experiment with these ideas of gene mutation with CRISPR, right? And I remember there was a dialogue, there was a conference or a seminar that happened and I so wanted to call in and talk about how, because what everybody's worried about with CRISPR is sort of like the idea of eugenics, right? So you're not creating a super race. But as Earth is getting decimated and we're looking into the future about where the neo-human could sort of inhabit. That's sort of where CRISPR comes in, where they might modulate your genes so that you don't get the effect of radiation or the effect of like low gravity could actually sustain humanity in sort of like these low orbits or even further reaching orbits. And I think that's a component of your thesis that I was hoping that you touched on because mm -hmm. you've sort of set up this construct that I think you know, you mentioned the idea of grids and like neighborhoods and like all these. Are, these are sort of like Earth-based paradigms that have been shaped over eons of humans living on Earth. But now that you're living in space and there's a whole set of different circumstances as guiding how people live, you know, somebody mentioned the ubiquity of all these pods and people maybe not being able to identify where they go. You know, that neo-human might have sensories built into their palms where they could touch a wall and it sort of dictates where they go, right? As we see what Elon Musk is starting to experiment with. And I think it's completely fascinating uh, I was wondering if you ever read the uh, science fiction of Octavia E. Butler. No. She's, a, she's an African-American science fiction writer. Unfortunately, she passed, and I've been sort of just nerding out on her science fiction, where she touches on all these sort of like new uh, relationships and new paradigms from, and sort of like going backwards into the human history and sort of overlaying like this history of sexism and slavery and, and how, how all of that could sort of manifest in a new future. Mm. And I think as you'll, hopefully, I'm praying that you continue on this trajectory and you keep exploring it further. I think having that as a basis of understanding as to like what, who is this neo-human that's going to inhabit this? And, you know, if they were to sort of circ circumnavigate the whole earth and they've built all these pods over a thousand years and now they need to move on to the next phase, how are they going to sort of integrate with these next quote unquote conditions that they may find on Mars that might actually spur a different language than you've discovered here. So it's sort of like this thing that keeps 
folding in on itself. It, it keeps propelling us into the future. And I think it's just wonderful that a, a, an architecture thesis student is, is, um, is, is asking these questions. I, I'm just, I'm like, wow, like this is, this is great. So thank you. But Mide, you know, in a certain sense, it's, it's all utopian, isn't it? And so the, the thing about utopianism is it is fundamentally escapist. So we don't see the strife of humanity here. We see a society where everybody is egalitarian. I mean, I don't, I, are there pods for the worker bees? Who gets exploited here? Um, there, there, there hasn't been a, you know, there, there, there was a, a reference at one point to where is Times Square in here? Where, where, where's the seedy parts of town? Um, those, the, so there's an aspect to this that is escapist. And there's another, there's this kind of another subliminal theme in this that it's about humanity. But the one thing that I guess I, as I look behind the images here and see the sphere of the earth, you know, we're the real parasite in this. And because we because we see ourselves as different from other species, and as the as Julie Gabrielli the other day in one of our lectures uh, for faculty illustrated that we see ourselves at the top of a Ponzi scheme pyramid, that we are somehow the supreme species on the planet. Yet an ecology requires the human species to work interdependently with other species. So I, I, I would say that, and, and Andrew, you made this as a comment that was for the human species and then uh, it was just echoed by Mide. I would think if this, if we're gonna be successful at some utopian place, one is the social dimension, which I don't understand in this. And number, and, and it seems escapist in that regard. And number two is, is that how all the species work together. And you don't have to respond to it, Andrew, because I, I agree. This is like, this is like, you're like one of those guys that have been juggling plates in vaudeville. You probably have never seen the image. But <laughs> those of us that are older know what I'm talking about. You've been able to do just about everything humanly possible in this project. And I applaud you for that. But I do think that fundamentally at the core, it's utopian, escapist, and it is, it is specifically human centric when we're calling for an age of thinking about reevaluating the Ponzi scheme that we've been participating in for so long as, as a species. So that's, that's my two cents. Great job, Andrew. Thank you, Brian. Um, terrific job, um, Andrew. And uh, I think it's uh, uh, time to uh, hand it over to uh, Lindsay, uh, your chair. Um, before, um, Casey is also involved as a um, advisor. Yes. The planning department. So Casey, is there anything you want to add? We've had a lot of opportunities to talk about it with Andrew, but if, if there's any kind of public reflections, um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts before I kind of close. Yeah, I just want to thank you for allowing me to participate in this. Like, like media, I'm also a sci-fi fan, and this, this is actually the, the book he was probably <laughs> referencing um, by Octavia Butler, The Parable of the Sower. And She's sort of a dystopian writer. Um, I, throughout this project, I was sort of pushing on the, the community aspect of this. You know, let's, let's try to think about what this community would be like. And I think over the iterations, that has come out more and more. Um, and I think, you know, I'd agree with Brian, there is an element of utopianism. I don't think you can do something like this without it being utopian. But I would, I would actually put, push back on the, on the idea that that's escapist. I think to some extent, utopianism is about sort of making the abstract concrete. You know, it's sort of transforming our ideals about good and what's right into a, a concrete form. I mean, it, we have so many examples of that failing, but uh, perhaps the, that was because they were earthbound utopias. <laughs> um, so you, you gave sort of a, a different take on the utopian tradition. I think it, this is certainly within that tradition. I think it, you know, uh, certainly embodies that, that kind of thinking. Um, and I, you know, I still, my mind is thinking through these questions that have been raised about the community. What would this community be like? And I think, and I think even it's okay to not project too much onto the, Form as to what that community might be like. You know, if you sort of create an, a, a sort of structure within which something can organically develop, maybe that's enough. And I think you've done that and you sort of created a very egalitarian sort of uh, physical form. Um, and within that, maybe there's 
different kinds of differentiation can emerge. And I, I really do uh, appreciate that sort of modularity that you put together. Um, so I just want to thank you for, for inviting me. This is a really fun project for me to be a part of. And, uh, you know, I hope to be on another, uh, you know, futurist uh, space architecture thesis, maybe. <laughs> Good job, Andrew. Hey, thank, thank you for your help, Casey. So it has been a total pleasure to work with you, Andrew, and a total pleasure to get to have these conversations um, that we or, you know, we've talked about so many themes today, but we've actually gotten to have those conversations unpacked over the course of um, a semester and a half at least. So um, I made a, a, a kind of short list of questions that we've got to talk about that I think everyone touched on. Um, the question of, can you flaneur here or have a situationist derive, which I think, you know, Adam started out talking about, you know, what is it like to kind of be here for real and what is the experience and what is discovery and and place, um, do you have a space passport if you live here? So what are the politics of the place? What is the geopolitical relationship to earth? Um, do people wear neckties in space? Um, talking about you know, figures and renderings. Are we, are we shuttling ties to space? Is that, you know, in the, in the kind of future of humanity? Uh, what does it mean to live in a round plan or a circle? What is the ground plane when there is no ground? Is there litter here? Does the public space get dirty? Um, are there trash cans? Are there mosquitoes and flies on the trash can? Um, and uh, I think as Gabriel was talking about, um, something that really struck me was as you rotate around in these neighborhoods, the sun will at times come in as it does on earth, kind of from above, but at the other sort of point in the rotation, the sun will come from the ground or from beneath you and reflect off the ceiling and back down. So um, can, can humans handle that change in perception from the sun always kind of being a celestial above us in section um, presence to being something that comes from below our feet? Um, and, and all of the range of things that we've talked in, about today briefly we've gotten to invest in. So I think that's been really um, a rich, rich experience. And I think the, the questions, so Casey pushed on community, I think I was always interested in, um, similar to what Jen and Brad were asking about, this interior experience. Why are the windows rounded? Why are the corners filleted in the planes of, um, you know, the kind of fenestration what is the nature of the furniture and walls? And I think um, you did a lot of work to explore all the scales, including that human scale. Um, and I think the kind of nature of, or well, nature is kind of a funny displaced word here, but the character of those interior spaces is, is where the role of the architect, um, in addition to conceiving of this whole, you know, ring metropolis, um, that human scale um, the tactile nature of um, the walls, the, the ceiling plane helping us navigate, all those interior experiences are really, um, I think, where the architect can have um, a very, very tangible and experiential role as well. Um, I've learned a lot over the course of the semester, and I think um, we've all learned a lot in the course of this presentation, but I think the most salient um, takeaway I have from this um, is that this is a really urgent topic. We started in thesis match um, actually a year ago. No, that can't be. Maybe. Or a, a middle of last semester. I don't remember when we sort of all mixed and, and mingled quite. about the thesis projects. But um, Andrew, our conversation in your thesis match meeting um, was around kind of the seriousness of this. And I, I remember asking you, is this like a conceptual speculative project? You didn't have any design work yet. Like, are you, are you archigram? Are you really doing this? And I think, um, you know, it sort of is so obvious with the breadth and the sincerity of the work you've produced that this is a real um, sincere proposal and that architects are urgently needed. We're behind actually. The fact that we're just kind of, that this is a, you know, not a thesis that's been happening 
kind of regularly for a long time, I think there's an urgency for architects to engage and have these conversations and be, you know, participants with engineers and with um, inventors and kind of um, the people motivated to make these things happen. Um, so thanks for a great semester, Andrew, congratulations. And thanks for um, all the great comments from the jury. It's been really fun to um, observe and hear everyone's thoughts. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for your help too. It's it's been it's been a pleasure and a joy. Um, terrific. Um, I'm wondering whether uh, our guests, uh, you know, we have we have um, uh, separate juries um, that come in for each of our segments, and so this is an opportunity. Uh, for our guests to to reflect on the the projects that they've seen um, in the aggregate and and kind of um, uh, comment in in any way that that uh, you feel uh, relevant um, uh, reflecting on the on the uh, the work of the day uh, the word infrastructure has floated out there a little bit um, and we've all kind of chewed on that a little bit. Um, but just an invitation um, uh, for um, any commentary that, that you would find uh, relevant on the projects of the day and, and also to thank you all uh, so much for, for, for joining us. It's been an incredibly uh, rich afternoon. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off. I mean, thanks uh, for inviting me to participate. I've enjoyed the projects and the conversation. And I think when I think about infrastructure, I guess the scale of each of the projects um, and the subjects that were being explored suggested to me that a lot of the purview of design is about thinking about systems of relationships between things um, and, uh, and what is the, how does invention or um, innovation happen you know, from those, the combinations that, it, that can be made or the, the way in which a system can be and a process can be envisioned as a design problem in and of itself, whether it's an urban planning project um, that has to do with you know, programmatic uh, overlays and adjacencies and kind of uh, new in, in, in changes in program and how people in space to um, kind of, you know, how do you address uh, uh, New way of thinking about urban planning, maybe the network. I guess I would have wanted to, the notion of a networked planning seems to be really interesting. In the second project, um, and then finally, you know, the issue we should be talking about in this project, just in terms of um, uh, weaving together a whole set, a gradient kind of the different relationships and the different scales from the individual all the way to the giant kind of. Um, uh, really creation of a new city um, of civilization in the project. So um, I guess um, I'm always intrigued with these. And, and you, you had the benefit as, as faculty here to see, or maybe, <laughs> but there's pluses and minuses to it to, see, to be part of the development, but, but to understand kind of the iterations that people, you know, uh, explored through their, through their work in these areas and to see, you know, kind of, forks and the paths that people took to get to where they ended up. Um, so I'm always intrigued by that because ultimately in a thesis project, you know, kind of in, in the best, in the highest version of it, you know, it's a time for a student to really begin to frame issues that they will continue to work on, you know, the rest of their career. And, um, and so understanding kind of the way in which not only the problem that the students set out for themselves, but also the the, the techniques that they that they use to develop it um, and to not get onto this point and what those offer in terms of lessons uh, or other areas to maybe work on more or explore more deeply or you know to to not go down the path again whatever so um, yeah that's interesting and, and you know there aren't that many thesis projects are not that you know common these days for a variety of reasons I mean many institutions don't have them and I think. You know, there's always the question of, you know, is a project just a, a more developed independent study project or is it a thesis? And, you know, that's also an interesting subject to think about and talk about. Not every project that a student does in their 
final you know semester study maybe is what you know quote unquote thesis which doesn't mean it, it doesn't have value for the student and for for uh, for everyone to talk about but that's also an interesting thing so i'm curious just to institutionally of maryland if this is like something that does every student do them or is this something that you know well, yes. you have to be selected for okay so interesting yeah, yeah. So that was a little bit of free associating, starting with the idea of the structure, but that's sort of some of the things gone through my mind at this point in the afternoon. Yeah, um, just just while you said free associating, free associating, I'm I'm sort of dying to ask the group or and you a question. Do you think? And this is going to seem like a cosmic question, maybe. Uh, what is what is the difference in the role of VR virtual reality in space? in an environment such as this versus its role on the earth. Well, in, in like TV, it's like the holodeck, right? And it's sort of to, to give you a sense that you're not in outer space, at least that's how I, one thing that comes to mind. Um, but uh, um, I don't really know, it's a, it's a good question. I wanna, I wanna just jump in and, and observe more than anything that I think these I saw these these three students projects all display the the power that architecture and architects have and I think it's 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 a lesson that you you can't learn um, you know any other way except for the way you're doing it now which is to do it and you know practice it and I, and I would say that, that there's a kind of couple of questions that come up for me. Um, one is, who is your client? And that, that's an important question because I think all three of you um, really have an idea in your mind about who your client is. And, um, and in some ways, I think you're all wrong. <laughs> so in some ways you all got it right, but in some ways you're all wrong. And I think that you know, a couple of people have pointed out how that might be the case. Um, and I think it's all, it's the case that we're always wrong. We're always fumbling around. You know, we design a museum and we realize that it's not for the people walking around seeing art. It's for the school children who will only ever visit this museum or, you know, it's, it's that's your client. It's not the people that you think it is. Um, and so I guess the question is, um, is, is more of a caution. It's, it's to be extremely careful in crafting the question of your project. And I think that to some degree or other, we all get that part again wrong, right? You kind of look back and you see, and that's why they call it practice because you get better and better, not at making buildings, but asking questions about what architecture can do. And, and I think for me, one of the things I learned today, which is great, um, is that you know, I see my job as a struggle to find a kind of language for architecture. And I think that people aren't really worried so much about that anymore, right? It's, it's these these projects really present a different use for, for architects and architecture. And that I really appreciate. You know, I think that um, I, I some, sort of narrowly define my job and I think you guys are gonna be in great shape because there's much more that architects can do as, as Lindsay said, you know, there's a lot that we should be doing. We should be at the table for, for everything. So, um, I just want to say, you know, thank you for raising those questions today. And and um, and as a teacher, um, having um, done some teaching over the computer like this, I want to just say to all of your instructors, congratulations, and and to all of you for getting through this. And I hope you, you can all get to to do this face to face. And I know Jamie loves to roll out the sketch paper. Um, and, I, and I've only ever worked with Jamie online. I've never actually been in the same room with you, but I feel like I know you pretty well in spite of that. So applaud you all for the work that you're doing, even online. Thank you, Gabe. This is great. Who else? I would like, just like to say um, uh, that I thought all three projects today were, were really ambitious projects. Um, uh, they, they dealt with uh, the physical form making or the urban space making in various ways. And it really led me to observe yet again, 
how architecture and non-architecture are so related. So the social, the clients, the, the sociological, the political, the economic, all, all that is related to built form or, or built form is related to all of that. And I think it's important that in our thesis work or, or all levels of our educational work that we keep that in mind. And, and maybe one day we will have a thesis that will be collaboration between a sociologist and an architect or a, a engineer, aeronautical engineer and an architect. Maybe we will learn that at some point we need to teach in a collaborative way and have students learn in a collaborative way. But thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Terrific. Thank you. I think Brad, you brought up a good point about collaboration. I what I missed in school was was actually talking to people of the communities that we were speculating on on building a new structure for. So I don't know how much of that research and physical interaction and the students were able to, to have in the last year. Um, but I, I just wanted to say that um, like thesis doesn't end now. And I think thinking about different ways to get your ideas and projects and narrative out there post-school I think is really important. Um, finding publications that maybe you can have excerpts of your thesis in there, getting it um, out in interviews. I've had friends and colleagues go on podcasts to talk about their thesis project. And so trying to expand your stories to a larger audience, I think is something that, I mean, we should all be trying to do um, rather than sort of always that designing in isolation and in this vacuum, because I think the ideas are really interesting you guys are all able to represent them in different ways and communicate those ideas. And so it'd be nice to see them live on in different medias after you graduate. Um, in, indeed, um, there was some dialogue earlier about some aggregations of, of thesis projects. And I, I think it's um, by place and by theme, um, and and I think I think um, that that uh, would be a, a very worthwhile exercise in in a number of different forums and a number of different different forms. Um, so, um, great. Well, if if that it kind of concludes um, the 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 jury comments, it's sort of a bittersweet moment. I think one of the things about the online environment is you have to close a close a meeting, and it's it's always it's always a little bit like uh, you know when it's been such a great meeting. It's always a little bit like closing your own thumb, and on we must. And and so this will be. Uh, uh, a wrap for today, unless uh, there's there's anything else that we need to deal with, um, Lindsay, administratively. Uh, but it's it's been such a delight. Um, I I uh, uh, just so much enjoyed the 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 dialogue and so so meaningful and significant on so many different levels. Um, and look forward to crossing paths with with uh, everybody soon. Um, Tomorrow morning, we begin uh, a, a new edition and a new adventure, and i um, looking forward to, uh, um, to seeing everybody there tomorrow. So with that, um, we're going to, uh, to close things out. Thank you so much to everybody. Great job everybody. to our thesis candidates. Congratulations. Take care. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.